Welcome to the January 12th, 2021 Town of Paradise Council meeting. There are no members of the public in the audience, but the council welcomes public com comment and participation in accordance with Governor Newsom's Executive Order N2920. Remote public participation is available through streaming at Town of Paradise YouTube cha Chambers channel. Public participation is also allowed in the following ways. Written public comment was accepted by email until 5.30 p.m. today and will be read into the record during the public comment section of the item by the town clerk. Comments are subject to the regular time limitations of three minutes per speaker. To comment on agenda items during the meeting, please call 530-872-5961. Comments will not be accepted after the public comment section of the item has closed. Again, please call 530-872-5951 for public comment on agenda items. We appreciate your patience as we go through this process. So with that, let's call our meeting to order and uh, in stand. Pledge of allegiance and it remains standing for our prayer. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to do the work of the town. Thank you for. Um, for you being here and, and the hand you put on us. I pray that you'll be with all the discussion, all that's said and done, and it's honoring and help, helpful to this town. We pray for the people that are out working in the streets and um, the police and the fire, just watch over them. And I just pray that uh, you hand on people and uh, protect them from trees that might fall. Pray for this night, and I just pray that it honors you. In your name, amen. No roll call vote. Roll call. Councilmember Bolin. Here. Councilmember Culleton. Here. Vice Mayor Jones. Here. Councilmember Tryon. Here. And Mayor Crowder. Here. Okay. Item 1E our campfire recovery updates given by our. Uh, Disaster Recovery Director, Katie Simmons. Yes, good evening, everybody. Katie Simmons, Disaster Recovery Director for the Town of Paradise. Pleased to provide you with the monthly recovery update. Hopefully they can hear me. Um, on the phone tonight, we have Cole Glenwright, right? I'm sorry, Cole Glenwright, Incident Commander for the Government Hazard Tree <clears throat> Removal Program. And he's going to be answering your questions in just a few minutes when we get to the Government Hazard Tree Removal. So very quickly, we're making good progress on the private program. The deadline, as you may recall, was extended by council to February 1st, 2021. That's the cut by and clearance in the private program. If folks had contractors secured um, by the last deadline that rolled around. So we have 89% of properties in the private program complete. So that is an excellent number. We feel really positive about that. We have about 5.4% of the total private program enrollees not complete yet. And we're doing a very targeted outreach to that group with our tree advocates, with phone calls and emails, and some additional social media. So we hope to be able to close that gap by February 1st to the extent we can. Uh, we're still sitting at about 875 properties that did not enroll in either one of the programs. And as you probably know, enrollment in both programs is closed. So we are working with the town legal team um, and working with the county on the abatement process. So this is going to be a very significant process that we're still designing. The timeline is still um, sort of to be determined as we work out sort of the, the due diligence pieces of that. But in coming months, we will be able to have updates for you in terms of how we plan to process what could potentially be up to 1,000 properties if we still have several uh, non-compliant in the private program. And then we did 
kind of close out the program with about 1,400 ineligible properties, and these were deemed ineligible through roadside assessments. As many council members know, because we're in direct contact on a regular basis, we are working with uh, private property owners through the complex process. Our tree advocates are helping, as is our ROE center. And then um, with the site visits that we're doing with council members, we're answering a lot of your questions so that you can be more prepared to answer those questions as they come up uh, from the public. So let's see. We are still waiting on decision for Category 4 uh, tree removal in hazard mitigation. So this is sort of the next phase of tree removal, and this will help us take care of trees that are ineligible in the government program. Um, the, we did just increase our ask for Category 4 trees, and we are hearing back, actually, on a lot of our hazard mitigation grant applications. So I'm fairly confident that we should have that information within a couple of months. What are Category 4 trees? Oh, so these are back 40 trees. These are trees that are far enough away from a public or private road that's eligible for, through the government program. And what we're looking at from hazard mitigation is a 75 to 25 percent match. The town will be looking for the, that additional 25 percent, which would make this program entirely free for homeowners um, who are looking for um, support to remove those trees. So we're still working on designing that program. It will be somewhat similar um, to the private program, but we're talking with other agencies that we could potentially contract with to get all of this work done. So that is still very much in design, still waiting on a response from hazard mitigation on our request, but pretty confident that we'll be able to get that work done again um, after the FEMA PA project closes. Thank you. Katie, would, yes. would individual property owners be responsible for hiring the people to all the trees or would there be some central contract do you know yes so my my recommendation and we just begun these conversations would be um that 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 the town would actually work on hiring the contractor to remove the trees because we feel that that would be the most seamless for homeowners who have now gone through this process a number of times for debris and hazard tree removal in the government program um, so we certainly have learned a lot through both of these programs and would have a package that we would um, be recommending in terms of how to develop that program. But it's still a little bit premature, really, to say what that design would look like. But we're absolutely learning from the programs we're conducting now. OK, thank yeah. you. But you Very don't think we're looking at months and months and months for us to get this program rolling? So let's or see. Or do, do you have any idea? Yeah, I mean, I would love to see Category 4 funds become available in 2021. Um, but what that means is we'd have to get a response back from hazard mitigation. We'd have to design the program, line up the contractors, and get all of that ready for enrollment for private property owners. So I feel like 2021 feels a little bit ambitious to actually get the money out there, um, whether we're doing the work or we're providing these funds to property owners. So I think we're probably looking at 2022 to be realistic. Seriously. So when we talked with FEMA, uh, or Cal OES, excuse me, about category four trees, the town did express our concern that as folks are going through government hazard tree removal or the private program, they're wanting to get all their trees removed once. So the fact that these funding sources are sequenced is really challenging for the town because FEMA PA comes first, which is what is out on the street right now in all these programs, and then hazard mitigation comes up behind that. So we definitely, as the town, advocated, I don't know where, I believe you might have been in that meeting with um, Deputy Director Ryan Burris. We definitely advocated for these to be moving parallel so we can make the Category 4 tree removal funds available while this, these other programs were going. Mm -hmm. So um, as, far as, as far as I'm aware, and I know some additional advocacy has been done through our consultancy with Ernst & Young, the funds are still sequenced. So will people be able to apply before, I mean, we're not like waiting for everything to be in place and then have people apply. Can we start having people apply so we have all those apps being processed prior to? So it feels a little premature to say how we're going to embark upon this yeah. process only because yeah. these programs are very complex. However, I will say that with everything that we have learned through administering all of these programs that we would have a streamlined recommendation for category four, um, because I would like to see sort of the onus removed from the private property owners in terms of like sign an ROE, we come in and get the work done, sort of like the government program. 
um, but we need to make sure that we have the contractors in place lined up for that. So it's, it's very premature to say how we would design that program. I'm just sort of giving you a sense that we're definitely talking about it and learning a lot from the programs we're administering now. Let me ask you a question. So when they did all of this assessment of all the dead trees in our town, or whatever program did that months ago, did they count all the trees? So my understanding is that they definitely did an assessment of trees that were eligible. In no, the that's FEMA not the program. question. The question and is, did, did they inventory the dead trees in our town or only those ones that were going to hit a power line or hit a roadway? So we did an assessment for the FEMA PA and we did an assessment for hazard mitigation, which should be my understanding for tree removal will be the remainder of the property. So they have to come back in and inventory all those trees. Again, like we've just gone through the last 14 months or 18 months. Yeah, there are two programs. So the FEMA PA program, which is going on now, and that's why the town advocated so heavily for us to be able to run these programs simultaneously. Process Nobody can hear you. Yeah, I, I guess what confuses me is in the beginning. The process is still gonna be the same. So they're still gonna have to be an assessment of yeah, the tree. Is, yeah. it, is it alive with an arborist and well, then you know, you're going to have all of the same environmental and, issues. And some of the problems we've had is some of the arborists weren't arborists. The trees that were marked as being alive then has subsequently died. But we've finished, we've completed the assessment part. But at one point after the fire, whether it was PG&E or however, FEMA, whoever did it, we, we were given numbers of like hundreds of thousands of trees that were dead within our town. Right. Yeah. And then now we're looking at 30,000 trees. The that, Fire Safe Council did that assessment. Pardon me? The Fire Safe Council well, did the assessment it's still, there's, there's, we're talking about, and they didn't do it by going around look, um, counting trees. They counted an acre, and they said that is representative of the town, well, that's and they bogus, extrapolated. Huh? Yeah, that's, bogus. that's why the numbers are coming out different. Well, and, it's and, still, it, and just remember, too, is that was done so long ago. There's been a lot no, of people that have taken their own trees yeah, down. Yeah, in fact, there's 300,000 versus 30,000. Right. It's just that... I'm looking at the process. I know how many different crews came through first to count an inventory and map. And then I saw how many crews came through the arborist, multiple ones mm -hmm. to come down and assess and then and then do it again. And then we're still waiting on the tree. Coming. Yeah, so that is an absolute truth. There have been a lot of crews on properties. So the town did a lot of marking right after the fire in the right of way. PG&E was doing their own hazard tree removal. You've got these two programs running, and then there will be the back 40 trees as well. So we do have Cole Glenwright on the phone. Um, I have included two of his slides, and I believe you should have handouts of both this and the next slide um, on the dais. So um, Cole, just introducing you to the call, incident commander. Cole was sort of our counterpart on the site visit that we conducted with Mayor Crowder and Council Member Tryon last week, and I know we're going to be setting up site visits for our additional council members, because I think that these are good opportunities for for you to be talking with those who are out in the field, diving into the specifics of all of these processes. So, Kohler, do we have you on the phone? Hey, good evening, Katie. I'm on. Great. So, Cole, what I've done is um, I've pulled up your slide on process. So, I think since we've just gotten to that in the Q&A with the council, that would be a good place to start, and then we can go into the statistics. My pleasure. Good evening, Mayor Council Members. Cole Glenray, California Governor's Office of Emergency Services and the State Hazard Tree Removal Program. Uh, Katie, yesterday I provided a brief overview on the process in general. I think this may be familiar to some, but we'll go over that at a high level. As Katie mentioned, we had the pleasure of having some members out in the field with our contractor team and our project management team. Um, and I think it's probably best to see some of this in action, but I'm happy to explain it over the phone and take any questions, and I can share some general progress statistics. So you sit up in front of you a chart that shows our, our general process at a high level. Um, you'll note the disclaimer at the bottom that there are, are cases in a large project like this that we don't follow the flowchart exactly, but for the majority of purple, um, we go through this too. So um, as discussed and as you're familiar, uh, this project starts with a right of entry permit submitted by the private property owner. So let's go to Butte County. Butte County um, has and had a very significant uh, infrastructure operation set up that evaluated those from there from the appropriate owner and then transmitted them to us as part of the ROE center. Uh, they're still continuing to validate some ROEs, but as mentioned, the ROE process is closed now, so that center will be standing down. 
Can you talk to us? I will schedule it for an assessment by a track certified arbor assessor, National Society of Arboriculture. Um, it's generally considered in the industry to be the gold standard of arborist. Cole. Uh, we're aware that hey. Cole. Arborist, but be elected Cole. Cole. Sorry, uh, Cole, sorry, I wonder, we don't have perfect audio in the room. I wonder if we can ask you just to slow down just a bit. We're losing some of your um, words just with the speed and the, the quality of the audio. Sure, I'm happy to slow down. Thank you. So, my pleasure. So at the assessment stage, that's when one of our certified arborists would review the trees that could potentially be eligible. Uh, but as previously discussed, that's within this project scope. Uh, that could hit public roads, eligible private roads, or other public infrastructure. We collect a, a good amount of data on the trees at that point, uh, photographs, dimensions, um, and they are painted with a blue dot and placed with a barcode that records them in our system. Between this stage and the felling stage, uh, the majority of parcels will also receive some level of review from our environmental and historical preservation team, uh, which are teams of biologists and archaeologists that are um, required to perform certain reviews in order to meet requirements of our, our federal grants and first practice rules to some degree. So we have 90% uh, of parcels have been through the arborist assessment piece. As mentioned, that's been going on for some time now, and we are um, approaching the end of that. Uh, we are continuing to make progress through there. We have uh, 41 arborists deployed across the project as of today, split between town and county operations. Once parcels are assessed, uh, they're, we, we schedule them through a fairly robust scheduling process with our management consultant Arcadis and our state planning team, um, and they're dispatched to our felling contractor um, in the town of Paradise. That's a joint venture of Stukit, uh, Odin, um, and a few other partners there that are performing that work. P31 is the principal partner doing the actual felling. Um, they're assigned with a monitor from Arcadis, which is the, uh, the management and assessment firm, as I mentioned. Uh, they confirm that on site before removing it. They conduct a site walk, um, then they process and remove the trees. Of note, we sometimes get the question if, as a government program or an emergency program, we're exempt from the forest practice rules. We are not. Our contractors comply with those. We do have both foresters uh, on our team and a good working relationship with Cal Fire to confirm that. Um, additional controls are in place there. Tree tickets are issued to make sure that contractors are only removing and only compensated uh, before the appropriate trees. Um, we then go through a few steps to remove the remaining material. Generally speaking, trees are fucked on site. Uh, limbs, small trees may be chipped for erosion control. Again, that they comply with our forest practice rules requirements around erosion control. Um, they're removed from the site, um, and we call them to a reuse facility. For the town contractor, they're going to Old Durham Wood in Old Durham. Um, so it may result in a, a crew from our contractor uh, visiting a site a few times for the felling, the processing, and the transport. And that's generally because uh, different members of the joint venture and different types of crews perform different specialties. We attempt to have the, the most specialized crew perform that work as possible. A uh, felt material has been removed. A uh, member of the state operations team uh, conducts a final site walk on the parcel. Um, generally, uh, we're seeing that there are some minor requirements for contractors to go back and remove remaining incidental material. Um, so that's a collaborative process with the contractor to make sure they've completed scope. It's a standard part of our quality control process. Um, here at uh, the state. Um, and after that, we process the uh, completion paperwork and return that to Butte County, uh, who works closely with the town to notify the property owners that they're complete. Um, so we can move on to the slide on statistics, Katie, unless there's any questions on general process. Yeah, I have a question on general process. If, if the wind blew down a tree that you marked, is your cutting team going to come and take that tree down too? So that's a good question, and I know we've gotten that question a few times. Uh, FEMA's stance on this is that that would not be eligible because it's not a hazard anymore to the roadway. Um, we are actively exploring a contract solution with our executive leadership to remove those trees. I know that's been of significant interest to the council and to the community. Uh, we understand the hardship that assuming those trees would be removed by us, uh, not budgeting for that, um, places on the property donors. So I, I had a productive conversation with my deputy director about this a few days ago. Um, and our contact team is actively looking at how um, how best to remedy that problem. Yeah. That's a kind of a non-answer. When, when am I going to get an answer for that? I'm happy to look back with Katie with an update at the end of the You know, who, who can I, I would like you to contact me after the meeting, maybe. I'd like to know uh, contact information. 
to talk to somebody directly at, the, at your contract team or FEMA or whoever it is, you know, just to uh, talk to those folks about it. And I could say we could definitely arrange that. One of the benefits of the site visits is making personal contact with a lot of the operational team. So you would have that contact information as well, including Cole. Say that I don't, it's hard to understand. Sorry, you're I know. Yeah, it's really um, I know. Uh, so one of the things that I was saying about the site visit is it gives you the opportunity to make personal contact with a lot of the, the leads and the operations kind of field work. And so Cole will be there as well, and you'll have the opportunity yeah. to get their uh, contact information. Okay. I've asked for that information before, and that's okay. what I'm following up yep. on. And I've met with some of these people in the field, mm -hmm. and that's what we're hearing in the field, okay, is this whole dilemma. And that's, you know, if the tree's a hazard, it's a hazard. If the money's there, take it away. Yeah, I would say that I, I, we know that Cole is actively working on that issue this, um, and with the contractors so, as well. So one of the things that you've got on the thing here is about uh, uh, life safety issues, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which are becoming a new priority. Mm -hmm. I understand it's a new wrinkle in this mm -hmm. whole program. But I, I watched a property where the winds blew down a tree. It left 25 foot of tree standing up. It no longer met the criteria to be taken down, but it still had the potential to fall down a dead trunk onto a person's trailer with people living in it. So we've got to get this resolved. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I know Cole is listening. Um, this was a hot topic during our site visit uh, on Friday, for sure. And so uh, part of it is, is that the way these contracts are designed is that the, the contract is designed for them to fall the trees. So once the tree has already been fell, is already on the ground, now they have to figure out a whole process for, for doing those. And, and we did not get a hard no. What we're getting is that they're working on it and they're yeah. trying to the figure process. it out. Yep. Any other questions on process before we move on to the stats? Is one other question. Mm -hmm. Is there, okay, on the process where, uh, okay, they fall a tree, now all the stuff's laying on the ground, the slash, what have you. They haul it and they stack up the trunks. So then they come and they pull the trunks. Now. I understand the specialized crews that do the different things. Is there any particular, according to the state's program, um, is there a time schedule? How long that flash and what have you can be left on the ground before it's picked up? Is it like a week, three days, six months? Currently, it's 48 hours. Or, okay. Well, that's not happening. So we we will be discussing that actually. I got a call from um, Incident Command. So the majority. So Cole, maybe you can speak to this. This is coming from sort of your end of the shop, but I believe that the maximum time any slash can lay on the ground is seven days. The goals of this program were forty eight hours. Can you tell us where we are at this time? Yeah, that's correct, Katie. So the maximum time our environmental permits allow is seven days. Um, the the Yes, for the contractors, 48 hours. In our experience, they're generally meeting that. We'd be happy to uh, get any specific information on, on subcontractors or crews that aren't. Um, but in, in short, it would be between 48 or essentially, you know, a time of selling, but no later than seven days. Um, and it, uh, of note, that's, you know, that's a really important to us. We know prior operations uh, did not have strong controls in that area. Um, we're really committed, and I know our contractors committed as well to getting that material on site. So, um, yeah. In all seriousness, if there are crews or, or subcontractors that you and your community are observing appear to not be following that, the state management team would be very interested. And, and we uh, we have a, a full team from the state operations uh, group and our that monitors that and tracks that. And again, we aren't seeing that as a, a risk factor from our contractors yet, but always happy to take additional input on that. And Cole, I have a question. It would that timetable perhaps change with a lot of wet weather? I, I mean, if it's pouring down rain and, and I mean, I, I know the damage that some of these crews can do in, you know, to the property when, when it's just a mud bath. So would, would that delay that? We wouldn't anticipate it delaying past the seven day mark. Uh, that's a pretty stringent requirement in our environmental review. Now, there are always potential exceptions in extreme circumstances, but um, our expectation and what we've seen materialize with our contractors is that they're looking at the weather ahead of time and they're scaling back their felling operations appropriately so that they don't have a significant amount of uh, material left on site if a weather event is, is upcoming. Okay, thank you. 
The last thing I will say on imminent safety threat trees is we have more granular detail on those properties that we're tracking that the town and county have reported to the state for priority removal. So we've been able to provide a different level of service to those property owners with pretty regular calls in terms of how their property is moving through the evaluation and prioritization and tree felling process. Um, so I would say the, you know, the feedback that we've given to the state, obviously, is we'd like that granular detail on all the properties so we can be more communicative with property owners in terms of where they are in this multi-step process. Um, but currently, uh, property owners can call what's called the TROC, and they can find out the more, the more detailed information by contacting the state on where their property is in, in this multi-step process. So we can move on to stats, if that's okay, just in the government tree removal program. Cole, I have your slide up. Thank you, Katie. Uh, I won't bore you with all the detailed statistics, but at a high level, as mentioned, we have 90% of the parcels through the assessment piece, um, and just under 10, that around 9% have been through spelling. So we've been at the assessment piece for quite a while longer, um, and we are actively working to ramp up the number of uh, felling and removal crews that our joint venture has working in the town to increase that metric there. Um, we're in a kind of an interim period of the project where we have both lines of effort open. Um, so as the assessment line of effort ramps down, some of those resources such as uh, biologists, archaeologists, arborists that are to some extent limiting factors will become available for supporting felling operations. Um, and then uh, as to get in their joint venture partners begin to spin up more crew removal crews, we'll see that number increase. Um, we do have 10 crew removal crews operating in the town at present. Um, and again, those are from C31 as the partner there doing the actual crew removal. Um, we've seen them to be uh, quite productive. That company has quite a bit of experience uh, in this area, and we're happy to have them as a partner in this. Um, the last statistic on there, just in case it isn't clear, is just the final sign off or final site walk. That references that quality control check I mentioned. Um, I, I wouldn't put too much uh, weight into that. That happens pretty quickly behind the selling operations. That's just our last check with a state representative. We have a team of uh, two professional Callaway team members out there, uh, both with backgrounds in steel operations and construction that are going behind and, and validating this. So that's what that last statistic is. Um, hopefully the rest of the help, but happy to take it. So in that meeting you referenced earlier, I was in with you, on <clears throat> you had said there was going to be ramped up to 50 crews um, and we're at 10. So is that even a realistic number to be, get at 50? So one of the complexities is that uh, the joint venture we're working with has elected to kind of split their resources between selling and hauling crews. So they have a substantial additional number of personnel supporting hauling, removal, um, and, and additional essentially 10 crews there across a couple lines of effort. Um, so we don't have an exact number of what we think is necessary to um, you know, complete the project in a timely manner. Uh, and I, I will say we're continuing to learn efficiencies from how P31 does their work to make sure they're being as productive as we can. I, I don't know if 50 is a, a target necessarily for us. We're looking to hopefully get to the 20 mark in the next little bit here um, as we um, move through some efficiencies and, and ramp that up. Um, and then I think, you know, what the incident management team continues to do through the ICS system is uh, set objectives and those objectives and kind of the start stop continue model to see if with an additional resources brought on, if we're um, seeing, you know, the appropriate increase in production, if there's other factors um, beyond just a straight increase in crews. So um, I, I don't know if we would see 50, if we really need or want 50. That was um, that was a planning factor we used. Um, but we'll, we're continuing to evaluate that. We meet with our team twice a week uh, to family discuss objectives and, and progress toward those. Um, and I, I'm certainly happy to look back with Katie on kind of projections that we're seeing in that regard. And one of the things that I would mention, too, is we've advocated for the state to dedicate as many crews as feasible to maintain the, the, the critical mission of the, of the project, but also address the life safety trees. So we are, we are asking the state to dedicate those resources to the life safety trees so we can get those down really quickly while continuing to move forward with the overall mission of the project. So, yep, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, that, and was, I, that was my next question. Yeah. So we have one crew on those safe and life, life and safety trees. 
So Cole, can you help us understand what resources you've currently dedicated to the life safety tree properties? Absolutely. Yeah, we currently have one of our tree removal crews that is focused entirely on that. Um, as we do with all lines of effort, we're continuing to evaluate that and we'll uh, resource that with additional crews if we need, if, if the workload is there. Um, initially, we were handling these um, kind of in a call response and trace the crews off and send them just to this work. Um, we've evolved that process to now have a standalone crew because the work is there to support it um, and we'll continue to resource it as, as it's required. So I guess my my problem is I didn't I didn't come up with the fifty number that was that came up from you guys, um, Cole and <clears throat> we started this process before Thanksgiving, and we're almost to the middle of January and we still only have ten crews. That tells me either we don't have the people to fill the contract and get the crews here, or we have a problem getting them here. Or logistically, we can't handle more, and I don't know which one of those it fits in. And before you answer, Cole, let me interject something to it. probably answer it both at the same uh, time. Is it, it, it is kind of, I, I mean, I heard the 50 number, same as uh, Councilman Bolin. And the um, problem is, you know, we relay this to people, and then it, it seems that the, the rules change, and it just really doesn't make, you know, anything that happens even if it's not within the town's control, it reflects on the town. And uh, I mean, I hate telling somebody, hey, we're, we're gonna have 50 crews and then, well, maybe we will, maybe we won't. Um, it, it's just not real comfortable. We kind of need to come up with a, with a game plan and stick to it and, and give people the, the correct information, quit changing the information, just like we did with the start dates. I mean, I'm, I'm still, hearing a lot of repercussions on that. So it'd sure be helpful if we could just stick to what we're telling people. Yeah, I understand, sir. I think all of us were frustrated with the procurement process and the time it took. Um, this is definitely an evolving process on the, the operational side, the number of resources, how we structure those resources. Um, but absolutely happy to loop back with uh, Katie and the appropriate members and uh, members from our contracting team to share uh, how they see this evolving. You know, I can't commit that it won't change down the road as the factors come into play, um, but always happy to make sure you have the most current information that we're Hey, Cole, this is Councilman Tryon. Just quick question. Is, is one of the problems with getting crews the um, condition of the trees at this point and the equipment that is required to, to take down these trees? No, we haven't heard that. Our, our joint venture is fostered to bring crews on as needed. Cole, this is Councilman Culleton again. Um, who does the scheduling? Who's involved in that? Is anybody from the town staff? Like, is my public works director involved in that? So the scheduling piece is done by the state incident management team and then the team at our status, which is our professional consultant. Um, what? We run it through the incident uh, action planning process, which is part of the incident command system, very similar to how we manage uh, wildfire responses, how we manage the debris removal mission. So town leadership does sit on our twice weekly objectives calls where we uh, set objectives, we discuss uh, uh, work for the period, tactics for the period, um, but the actual uh, detailed scheduling parcel by parcel uh, is done by a full-time team at uh, both the state, Arcadis, and, and with significant input oh. from the contractor, the timber uh, uh, Okay, well, again, I, I would like, I, I would, I'd be curious about who from the town is involved in that, but other than that, whenever, it would be nice if we could see the schedule. I mean, I have people all the time asking me, you know, when are they gonna cut down the trees? And I can't tell them. I, and if I tell them to call the tree advocates at the brick, they don't know. So I could add a couple of things there if I might. The, the ways in which the town and county are involved in scheduling is in providing the state with the list of properties that have active building permits, standing structures, those types of things to make sure that those properties are prioritized for removal in the scheduling. And then the, uh, the life safety threat trees, we are involved in that as well. Nope. Um, it, so the tree advocates and this, the ROE center do not have scheduling information. So right. those centers that are managing enrollment do not have scheduling information, but the tree removal but, operations center does have scheduling okay, but information. We're telling our citizens yeah. 
if they have any questions about the mm -hmm. trees, to call the tree advocates sure. that have no information well, for so, the questions they're asking. Okay. Yeah. And my concern is uh, there was a bunch of trees cut down on the Hillby curve and left there. They've been there a while. Uh, John Rank, a citizen, went out and cut some of the wood up because it was left in the bicycle lane that's there. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to our public works uh, manager, mm -hmm. and he says that's one of the most dangerous sections of road to drive. So whoever's doing the scheduling, whoever's looking, I mean, if we have areas where a tree could fall, they're highly traffic areas, they need to be prioritized. Life safety, I get it. That's that new wrinkle. But we have other things. So I don't know who this committee is that's making these decisions, but we need to, we need to maybe give them some more uh, information, some more intel, so they can make better decisions. The last thing that I would say is uh, the state was required to um, work with the town and the county on encroachment permits. So public works is involved in, in inspecting all of the sites where the tree felling and removal is occurring. So we are on site often, but I hear what you're saying and I understand it's, so one of the things, and, and maybe those who have been involved in the site visits can attest to is we talked a lot about scheduling and I totally agree. And we've given this feedback to the state. We need more granular information on the properties to be able to provide property owners with information we, when they call for sure. Katie, we were given yeah. money. We marked trees in the Republic right away with a T1. Mm -hmm. So the state program has some directive to go and, and just put a blue dot on it and cut it down. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about, we have some hazardous trees, just like up going to, into the county across the dam. They're not being prioritized. Hillby Curve, Pearson Road is yeah. one of the most highly traveled roads. One of those trees come down in a storm on a rainy, windy night, yeah, and it's going to fall that. on somebody's car, and they're going to yeah. get they're going to get hurt. Yeah, absolutely. And so, whoever this little committee is, we need to either put Mike Kudak on that committee, or or you know, I don't know if you're on it, or but we need to put somebody there that knows what's going on mm -hmm. on our roadways and can say, here, these need to be first. Yeah, I think that's great feedback. And it mirrors what I've provided as well. I, I'm sorry. Yep. I, I get all passionate about that. No, I, mean, I think that's great. Trees are a big not, topic. Not yeah. Just... Any other questions on trees? We have a bit more to get through <laughs> tonight. <laughs> so I would encourage those who have not been on a site visit um, to participate in one. Kevin and I did participate as well. And I think that that provides a bit more information, just being out on property, looking at the site, being able to ask questions as you see operations occurring. Um, I'm answering a lot of questions available all the time. Our tree advocates have enrollment information, as does the ROE Center and the T-ROC. So people are having to deal with a couple of folks, certainly to get information, and that's not the way that we want it to be. The one difference that I would say between Category 4 and the process we're going through now is whereas the funding for this removal went to Cal OES and Cal Recycle, the funding for Category 4 trees comes to the town. So that is a different opportunity for us really to design a program that kind of mirrors what we're really looking for in tree removal. But I just want to, you know, personally thank Cole for being on the call tonight. They are working very, very hard. They have a very tough job. It's a very complex process. We are very frustrated. Our property owners are very frustrated. They've been through so much. We take a lot of calls and this is difficult really for everybody. So our hearts go out to everybody. We're available for these questions and we really just want to get through it and get through it really safely. And that's really the objective. So that is true. Katie, can yep. I make a comment? Sure. Um, I was just looking at these statistics. If I'm reading this right, the eligible trees are 31,000 and 5,200 have been cut down. <laughs> trees. That, uh huh. That's 20%. I think yep. that's pretty good. So we're making we progress. Should, as, yes, we as should Cole not said, ignore the progress yeah. we're making. So 90% of the properties enrolled in the government program in the town have been assessed, which is excellent. Almost 90% of the properties in the private program are totally done. So trees are coming down. You know, I love seeing those logging trucks. You know, obviously, you know, we don't love it, I shouldn't say, but as those trees are full or the trucks are full and moving down, we know properties are becoming clear. So we're we, are we are making, making good progress. We we're just are. making it, it's painful. No question about that. Okay. Anything else on trees? <laughs> All right. Thank you, Cole, for now. For now. Okay. So um, I'll really quickly jump through this early warning system. As you recall, you did approve the design and scoping plan for the early warning system, which is the construction of siren towers in town. We did submit our construction grant for hazard mitigation for the early warning system. So we're tracking that very closely and are hoping to see those construction funds awarded to the town for the early warning system, which is a top priority, tier one priority in the long-term recovery plan. 
Uh, the reseeding planning grant was approved right on time as the trees are coming down. This is again a design and scoping plan from hazard mitigation that will help us understand how to reseed, replant the ridge for better erosion control and weed mitigation over time. So we're just preparing that RFP, it's with Town Legal to send out so that we can hopefully get a consultant lined up for that. Well, those are on public properties, not on private properties, right? Um, that will actually, so, so the reseeding program is just an education campaign. So okay. we're going to be t helping private property owners as well as ourselves and commercial businesses understand really how to replant. Not actually doing it. It's exactly. just education? It is an education campaign, absolutely. Okay. okay. So broadband feasibility coming back to council in February. This will hopefully align with our goals in the undergrounding uh, of the utilities project. Emergency management planning. I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about that later in the after action report presentation, but that is definitely ongoing. And then we were just approved for the first ever residential ignition resistant improvement planning grant from hazard mitigation. So this will provide us, uh, it, this is just planning again, so this is not actual implementation. But this may potentially, uh, if we get the planning done, will provide us with funding for, for those in the burn scar and within the town of Paradise specifically with this project who have a standing structure, their home survived, but their home is not up to current building codes and standards. So this would provide us with funds to be able to grant to these homeowners so they could, in, they could make improvements to their home like new windows, new roofs, you know, fences, decks, those kinds of things. So this is a program, uh, again, first of its kind, but we're really proud to be able to get the planning going on that, and that was recently approved. And so is this just for standing homes, or what about homes that have been rebuilt? No, this is just for homes that survived the fire. Yep, that are um, below building codes and standards, older do, homes. Do you know how many houses that is? Uh, gosh, the number I heard was about 1,200, 1,300. 1, yeah, I was going to say over 1,000 yeah. anyway. Yeah. Okay. So we, we have... Okay. Assuming not, that would be the number everybody's who would going to do it though. Right, okay. exactly. Yep. We have some really interesting statistics when I bring that again to council, talking about the percentage of homes and the age of those homes that actually survived the fire. So definitely um, the residential ignition resistant improvement program will really help us protect those homes that are still standing. On the housing side, oops, really quickly. On the town administered housing programs, we are processing 47 applications in our housing programs. We have room for much more. We think some of the pause on that has to do with the pg e settlements that have not been uh, received yet. So a um, little bit of a pause there. Uh, in the interim housing ordinance, which we are tracking, we're still seeing about 34% compliance. We have 593 uh, temporary use permits that have been applied for um, 67 have homes completed. We're just kind of tracking these numbers as we go on a monthly basis, because um, as we know, council did move the um, interim housing ordinance deadline to mid 2021, and then with some, with some additional conditions met to the end of 2021. Uh, CDBG DR, we are engaged in a lot of really exciting conversations with HCD on infrastructure, owner occupied funding and multifamily housing. Um, the master services agreement I'm bringing to you shortly is for an allocation of 55 million in multifamily, pool of 205 million for owner occupied, and then infrastructure. We're kind of building our case for a lot of the projects in our capital improvement and disaster recovery um, portfolio over the next several years. Um, distressed cities technical assistance, we did receive this assistance through a grant. They are administering a HUD funded survey to help us understand really more of the demographics of those that are living in paradise, information that we need not only for planning and economic development, but also for our grant application. So we're really excited about that. And then consolidated plan, the RFP is due, I believe next week, and this will help us understand how to utilize our, our entitlement community funding. Uh, let's see, Urban Footprint is also a tool we're looking at using for um, building uh, as a central sort of data point for the many layers of data that we're tracking on Recovery in Paradise, helping us understand really hopefully would be a good tie into the fiscal modeling we're doing to really understand how as the town recovers both residentially and commercially, how we can um, sort of see our overall recovery over time. So that's a really interesting tool. Um, on the advocacy side, at the last council meeting, uh, the federal advocacy platform was approved. We've been very busy sharing that with our 
uh, partners in advocacy, finding some synergies, especially with Butte County, who I believe just approved their federal advocacy platform last week. And then we are putting, uh, identifying next steps and setting up meetings with staff and elected officials. So as those opportunities come up, we're really looking to pair council members with certain interests in the federal advocacy platform with those elected officials or committee members so that we can help sort of build the case around what our specific ask is in our platform. And then the town is preparing a comment letter um, from a staff review of the Board of Forestry Fire Safe Regulations and that letter is sort of still coming together, but we would be joining with PID and a number of other agencies um, sort of making comments on what could be very restrictive for uh, communities like Paradise and High Fire Severity Zones or communities that are recovering like ours. And then I think that's my last slide. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> I'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Good job. I, um, before you go away, yes. Katie, that Board of Forestry thing. Yes. Um, I don't know a lot about it, but what I do know is very scary for Paradise. So I know that there's a whole coalition opposed to it. And, but what I was going to say is don't hesitate to call on us for help in that effort. Could you? I sincerely appreciate that. Yeah. And I, I always have that in my mind. I think you probably always have that in, in your mind. We sat on the rural communities, rural county uh, rural County representatives of California today, we sat on that call. We talked with Assemblyman Gallagher's team last week about it. We've talked with HCD, PID, and a number of other agencies. So our letter is um, probably going to be one of the most stringent, of course, because we, we are concerned about a lot of the specifics within the proposed changes, um, but also on how this will impact our ability to recover, which Paradise obviously has a, has a, um, you know, a case to make in that area different than other communities. So they're taking written comments right now. Yes. Are they going to have a hearing or anything like that? Yeah. And if they do, having elected officials there might be helpful. So what I can do certainly is we will find out when that hearing will be. Comments are due by January 1920. So we're preparing this letter to go in really in, in alignment with the other agencies that I mentioned. And then there's a workshop coming up, and I'd be happy to forward that information um, to, to the council if you would be interested, and then the hearing information as well. Thank you. Yeah, sure. You, you know, we, somehow, may have, sorry, we, we may have partners that we could leverage in, in the agricultural community mm -hmm. and things like that that would actually also um, join in. And so we might want to take a look at that, too. So what we can do is put kind of a package together with our letter, the workshops, the hearings, where to submit comment letters, and maybe the agencies that we're working with, and we'll send that to the council. And if you see any gaps or want to forward that on, I would encourage you to do that. Because yeah. Maybe even Farm Bureau and, oh, and sure. those other agencies. Yeah, contractors, will. board, and everybody sure. else. Mm -hmm. you, we need to let the public know about it. This is onerous. I don't know if you guys read it. It's bad. It's really it, it'll bad. Shut, yeah, it'll shut our town down. Yeah, I've been... Valley View um, homes will go away. Yeah. I've been a little chirping birdie on Campfire Collaborative, all the agency you know, meetings but that I sit on We need to communicate sure. it with the, the citizens, the, the residents. We need okay. to let them know about it. They can't... It can't be just one of those things that's just talked about at staff level. You know, it's got to be, because those people can, you know, property owners can write into this commission too. Mm -hmm. You know, so, it's you just know, crazy. An idea that I have then as part of the package that we could send to council is we could send out a press release with a link to our letter sort of as a little bit of an example and say this is what the town's comments are. And then if private contractors, you know, because that would be public information, so then if contractors want to join the coalition or, or, you know, everybody has an association, every industry has an association. So they can either see what we're writing and join up with comments or they can find their association. Yeah, I think it would be helpful. I think the more people we can make aware of how onerous this is. Yeah. You know, we had the same challenge years ago with the uh, stormwater stuff. And we just, you know, the, the water board was able to get it through. And now it's one of the most onerous things out there. So, I mean, it, I, I just would suggest it. Yeah. The more we can let the public know, and I think that's a good idea. Sure. Somewhere I got an email, because there's a meeting real soon. Like Yeah, there's a workshop on the 13th. I'll send all that yeah, information it's, it's like to a you just so you have. Notice. You can make comments yeah. and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So there's an, another thing that has been successful with other organizations is, and I don't know, I know that we're still working on our website, mm -hmm. but um, there are ways that you can set your website up to where citizens can go on and they can, you know, 
basically click add their names and that letter is sent to mm -hmm. um, the elected officials that it needs to go to, um, especially before the hearing. Yeah. And I'm not, they won't read everything, but they do count. And so I think that's kind of maybe a way that we could help is, mm -hmm. is if we have something set on our website that our citizens can just go on and, go, yeah. you know. I, or I a link to the that. industry associations that represent us, like League of California Cities, and they can just join the coalition for sure. So yeah, we can definitely, because I know your, you know, Cal Chamber does it for their legislative watch and all of that. So yeah, that's definitely a tool. I mean, we could look into that for our website, but I know we can definitely um, provide a copy, just in the interim, provide yeah. a copy of our letter and say that this could be used as a template for other contractors who, who wish then, to submit And then letter. push it out on our social media yeah. forms too. Okay. So. Because I think I'm advocating for, let's get our citizens involved mm -hmm. fighting the fight. Mm -hmm. they, they'd like to be a part of, of the, you know, not just us making decisions. And, yeah. You know, so let's get them involved. No, I definitely hear you. And I think that, that sometimes these types of changes kind of fly under the radar a little bit too much. And, and then suddenly we're stuck with having to change our municipal code. So um, we'll definitely, I'll put a package together for council on kind of what's coming up and a copy of the letter. Thank and you. then we can um, talk about a press release and, you know, make that copy available and all that. So there's a lot we can do. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Advocacy is thank fun. You. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. I don't know Thanks how to keep it straight. <laughs> Keeps coming. Uh, <coughs> it might be of the town's interest also to look into a lobbyist at the state uh, level. We have the lobbyist obviously at the Fed level, but a lobbyist at the state level when these things come up do make a difference. And I know um, my experience at PID, we had a lobbyist over there and it made a huge difference on keeping track of things that do fly under the radar and then bringing in the right groups ahead to to oppose or to support so does uh, league of cities have a, a lobbyist i'm sure they do but they they lobby for all cities right that's true and, we have uh, different we, interests well, what about yeah. the and committee of rural the rural the rural uh, counties again, thing, you again know. there's they they would lobby for all of them it might be interest it might be in the town's interest to really look at somebody specific to us and our needs moving forward so uh, i'm, I'm going to probably bring in that forward to the to the council Spending Thanks, that money. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so next up is uh, our transportation master plan uh, presented by our uh, public works uh, <laughs> town see. engineer, Mark Maddox. Hello, Mark. Hello, uh, council members. Uh, good evening. Glad to be here and uh, certainly wish I could be there in person, but this is the, uh, I'm grateful for the, all the hard work for the next best thing. Can you guys hear and see me okay? Mm -hmm. All right, good. great. So tonight I'll be presenting uh, the update on the transfer, transportation master plan. And I'm gonna go ahead and share uh, my screen to be able to give you this presentation. Uh, so with the transportation master plan, it really originated with the community long-term recovery plan uh, formerly back in 2019. And it was really just a testament to virtually everything we do in public works and in all of the departments is centered from this long-term recovery community plan. Um, and specifically, this plan identified goals and objectives relating to evacuation routes, interconnected path system, miss missing road segments, undergrounding utilities, creating a walkable downtown and planning and zoning and an economic development strategy. And so with the transportation master plan, uh, we were able to secure a grant through the Economic Development Administration it's a $1.8 million grant uh, secured late last year at 100% reimbursement. And our kind of overall objective is a comprehensive review of the transportation system, establish new goals, policies, and position the town forward for future grant funding and implementation. So we have, uh, with the on-call civil procurement we did, that took us about eight months last year, uh, we were able to issue a task order, even though the grant was just approved two months ago. Uh, we have gone through the expedited procurement process and ready to issue the task order to Mark Thomas and their team of specialists that are going to partner with them and help us through uh, this project over the next year. So I'm going to break down the uh, scope of work by category. And the first is the circulation and evacuation components. It includes analyzing the town's transportation network, public and private performing a capacity analysis on our arterials and intersections using pre-fire and current and forecasted conditions for traffic volumes, 
I recommend new high value road connections, new or improved intersections, reconfigured streets and other solutions. Um, as you know, we are, have a plan to repave almost every uh, public road in paradise. And so that presents quite a lot of opportunities to leverage and make any changes we need to do so at that time. Um, also relating to evacuation, we're going to re review and revise internal and external evacuation documents. We're going to facilitate the campfire corrective action plan objectives, as you'll be hearing more about that later this evening. And we're going to establish corridor design standards for roadway striping and infrastructure. Um, here's one uh, potential example. We've heard this in the long term recovery plan, but we can memorialize it, say, for Pence Road or Neal Road, that we want to work towards securing funding to widen our roads to include at least one lane in each direction with a modified uh, center two way left turn lane. And then also work towards establishing that multi use path on the as a grade separated facility that can use uh, for 99% of the time uh, be a walking and bike path and uh, but also could be used for uh, ingress and egress for emergency vehicles or um, actual evacuation for the general public. So moving forward to economic development as it is an EDA grant we worked in a lot of um, economic development components to the transportation master plan. Uh, that includes evaluating parking management for existing and proposed commercial areas, truck route mapping, a non-residential market study, which I believe you'll be hearing more about that in the next uh, campfire update from Colette Curtis, uh, reviewing the development impact fee documents to help facilitate future improvements. And we'll also have an update on that also in this meeting uh, from the town manager. But then also we're going to work towards developing and uh, updating our design standards, addressing the public realm items, including roadway and sidewalk features, signage and wayfinding, public open space, parking lots, alleyways, as well as private development, architectural styles and themes for both residential and non-residential properties. And this will occur largely in two areas, kind of focused in the downtown and then an update for virtually everything else outside of the downtown zone. As far as um, the work, including planning documents to position us for future grant funds, uh, we will be getting a, a full, complete active transportation plan, and uh, that will help us identify new projects, which, for example, like the multi-use pathways and make us more eligible or more likely to be awarded funding under the active transportation program. We're going to get a local roadway safety plan. We have um, other documents that kind of um, overview safety and paradise and collision data and history, but they're administering the highway safety improvement program. They're moving towards a requirement where we shall have a local roadway safety plan in order to be eligible for these funds. And so this transportation master plan will definitely check that box for us as well. Relating to survey monumentation, this came up last month in our updates and there were some questions about what exactly the TMP will provide. So um, working with Mark Thomas, we are able to tell you that we will be reviewing existing boundary markers along major roadways, resetting missing markers in select locations to help redevelopment efforts identify property boundaries. And then we'll also be setting new elevation markers along major roadways uh, to a lot to coincide with the repaving efforts and ensure that we have good uh, horizontal and vertical control for road improvements and storm drain improvements. Moving forward, the TMP also includes uh, work for utilities coordination. Uh, we're doing that a lot on our own, but we're going to bring additional staff and effort towards this to coordinate with the local utilities, PG&E, PID, AT&T, Comcast, to identify and mitigate utility conflicts with proposed transportation improvements. And we're also going to minimize schedule conflicts that might cause utility work um, in recently paved roadways and organize program improvements as much as possible. And then also I'm excited to share about our road condition recovery plan. Working with uh, Mark Thomas, we're going to generate um, kind of an approach over the next couple of years as we look to uh, design our um, rehabilitation of all public roads in paradise. We know that the timing of each of these roads um, where PID is complete, but PG&E isn't, um, or, or there might be some other factors on a road by road basis. So 
We're going to work with our consultants and um, our recovery partners to develop kind of a menu of projects that'll be um, on the shelf and ready to go. And once a specific road meets certain criteria, undergrounding is complete, uh, tree removal is complete, um, ensure that PID is the water system is down, then we can um, go ahead and issue a notice to bidders for the recovery or the rehab of that specific road or a selection of roads. So we don't necessarily need to wait the entire four years um, to start delivering some of these projects. So we're excited to go forward with that plan and then start de delivering some of these road rehab projects uh, beginning in 2023, and possibly even sooner than that, depending on the recovery projects, uh, as I mentioned. Okay, and then also the TMP will help us update our public work standards and uh, developing new standards for work in the public right away, considering travel dimensions, travel lanes, bikeways, on street parking, sidewalks, uh, landscaping, uh, road designs, traffic index, and truck routes. Um, I, I showed here one of our, I think this must have been prepared closely after um, incorporation of the Town of Paradise where we have road standards for interior roads that just spec out a double chip seal at, a, at an undersized width. And um, so we wanna really kind of update all of our public right of way and our design standards for that come through the Public Works Engineering Office review. And again, all of these would come before the council uh, when they're prepared and we can have a, a, bigger, a bigger discussion about impacts to the community on those standards. But, um, these updates are overdue as um, design requirements have changed and we want to make sure that any new facilities that go in in paradise, they're going to be ones that last uh, for many, many years to come. And then also um, the TMP includes a robust uh, public outreach effort and their mission. Uh, they've got a whole consultant teams for this uh, to put it all together and make it happen, especially in the uh, COVID reality that we're living in right now. Uh, their job is to engage and inform the town residents, relocated members, elsewhere, local stakeholders, influencers, public agency partners, local businesses and organizations. So um, each of those, for example, like the ATP plan, the local safety roadway plan, um, the design standard updates, each of those needs the, that public centric feedback um, to make it all work. So we're going to leverage this into one um, operation and um, make sure the public is has an opportunity to provide input along the entire uh, journey. So with that, um, speaking of journey, it is um, all of the items that I walked through here are represented on the schedule, but really what I want you to know and take away is that we are prioritizing these um, items of work accordingly and showing that we're going to have deliverables relating to circulation and evacuation um, as soon as possible within the next three months, three to four months, and then the EDA economic development items are kind of going to be more late spring, summer, and then some of the lower end items will be later this year. But we expect the overall effort to take about 12, 12 months uh, through the entire year of 2021. So with that, um, I'd be glad to answer any questions that you or the community might have. Mark, would you mind going back to that last slide for a moment? Sure thing. Thank you. Uh, no problem. The schedule? Yeah. Okay. I'm so, I apologize for the uh, granular text here, um, but in general, you can see the broader uh, project task, uh, circulation and evacuation here in the highlighted rows and then the kind of subtasks underneath those. And so with the survey and monumentation efforts, we're targeting uh, summer 2021. Um, but again, we have to be really careful about the investment in re setting new monuments. A lot of this information will be established and transmitted to the design team working on the road rehab. Uh, we don't want to set, for example, 20 to 30, you know, 20 to 50 new monuments in town just right. to have, have to reset them here within the next year or two uh, following the work being complete and the actual road construction starting. But other than that, um, I guess I'll just finish and just say we are extremely grateful for EDA um, providing this grant and um, looking forward to delivering what 
we've heard from the community and get the calls that we get is what's happening with the roads, which roads are going to be widened where and when and how, um, and how does that affect us and how does that affect, you know, Pence Road or Neal Road, Upper Skyway. Uh, so the transportation master plan as a whole aims to answer a lot of those questions. And again, like, like many of the efforts even described in the prior agenda item update through Katie, is that um, this is just the beginning. Um, there are some hard deliverables here, but we are being encouraged through EDA and other funding sources to get this part done and get these applications in for actual construction delivery. But this in general is gonna complement what we have and puts in a good position for new projects moving forward. Mark, this is Jody. I think this is fabulous. Um, this is a really complete plan. Um, we have a complex situation here in Paradise, even though our transportation system is rather simple. Um, with all the work going on, just trying to figure all of this out is pretty complicated, and I think you've done a great job. And in the end, we're going to have something that's cohesive and makes sense and um, reflects what our community wants. So thank you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that feedback. It's certainly uh, a complex puzzle, and the further we go through all of our departments, it feels like the pieces are easier to put together. Uh, just there's different paces, and so we're we're certainly doing our best to work through it. And so, thank you. Gonna miss that vibrating in my truck as I drive through town. <laughs> Yeah, uh, give, yeah, like I said uh, a couple months ago or a year ago, is give us to 2024, 25. We will have the nicest roads, you know, absolutely in Butte County, but I mean, if not California as a, as a community, our pavement condition index uh, will be off the charts and uh, there will be a lot of people interested in calling Paradise Home for that reason. Cool. Very good. Any more questions? All right. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Great presentation. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Yep. I'll see you guys soon. Thank you. So next we have a business update by our assistant to the town manager, Colette Curtis. Good evening, Council. I apologize for the delay in um, getting up here trying to get the screens going. Um, so tonight I'll be giving the economic development update. I have a couple of slides to go over um, what I'm talking about this evening. Um, so first of all, I want to welcome you all to Donut Paradise um, because we are excited to announce that we are working with three donut shops that are planning to come to Paradise um, over the next several months to year. Um, so, well, at least we're happy. <laughs> yes, it's, it's exciting. Who doesn't love donuts, right? So um, we have Mad Natter's Donuts, who's going into James Square on Clark Road. Uh, Dalio's is working um, to submit their plans to rebuild in their original location, which is so exciting. Um, and we have GNC Donut Shop that is planning to go in, in the Holiday Shopping Center as well. So the town is working with all of them to submit their plans and get those stores open. And we're very excited to welcome all of them to town. Is the POA support backing this? <laughs> I just thought. <laughs> Great question. I, I I can't speak for them though. You'll have to ask. You'll have to Police ask them. Officers Association. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so I wanted to That's give exciting. our 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 business uh, spotlight this month. Um, so we've started doing a weekly business spotlight in our weekly updates. And this week, our business that we're spotlighting is Mihos. Um, of course, located on Skyway, a very well loved Paradise restaurant. Um, they're ready to serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They are still there and open, serving our population. Um, and you can visit them online for their restaurant, including their famous two-pound grande burrito. Um, so they're open Monday through Saturday from 8 to 5, um, and they're a wonderful hometown location to go and visit. So we're so lucky to have wonderful restaurants like Miho still operating in paradise. And again, more joining us every day. Um, so just wanted to go over a few of the things that we're working on for economic development uh, right now and into the next months and year. Um, we're, of course, as you know, working to update our website, um, which is going to be a brand new uh, a brand new website that will have a much uh, more robust and expanded business section. It will have a toolkit for businesses, as well as my next bullet point here, a development opportunity site map. So that is something that 
Um, we've really wanted for a while. This is something that potential businesses can use to find locations where they can either build or purchase property or rent property that's available in Paradise. And it will have information like zoning, what's currently uh, available on the property, whether there's a building or whether it's ready to build on, um, and including other information. So that's something we're working on with the Paradise Chamber of Commerce, Rebuild Paradise, and also um, is going to be something that will be coming out of that transportation master plan that Mark talked about. Um, we're also, and I've talked about this before, doing some industry listening sessions. So we're gathering information from our local industries. We're starting those um, here this month. And we're very excited to start gathering that information to start crafting our own economic development recovery plan. Um, and then um, what I have just mentioned is our economic development strategy, which is really a recovery plan. And Mark mentioned the non-residential market study that's part of our um, transportation master plan. This is integral to one of our long-term recovery projects, which was an economic development strategy. Um, so right now there is an economic development strategy document that's being created for the region, and it really is a tri-county study. We're very interested to see the outcome of that in the next few months. However, we really need one that is central to Paradise, that looks at Paradise as its center um, before understanding the rest of the region. And that's what uh, this, this study will do. So this EDD, the, excuse me, this EDA funded section of the transportation master plan will look at some projections for the uh, sites in Paradise and, and look at how we can uh, expect those to grow over the next few years. So this will give us some much needed information as we craft this recovery project. And um, oh, and then finally, I just wanted to mention that the Small Business Assistance Grant um, that is through the state of California for COVID impacted businesses was extended. Um, that deadline previously would have been last week, but tomorrow is actually the last date for businesses to apply for that assistance. So eligible businesses can get up to $25,000 for COVID related impacts. Um, you just have to go online to their website, which is there on the screen, careleafgrant.com. Um, and again, those applications are due tomorrow. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. New businesses that come to town um, on our current website, can people go see any of this stuff? Uh, Currently, like, current like if you, if somebody wanted to know if, if a business, like the rumor ran around last week at Target, somebody was going to go in the old Rite Aid mm -hmm. building or something, you know. But right. I mean, can people, <laughs> I'm finding it really difficult to go to our current webpage mm -hmm. and find anything. Sure. You know? Yep. But, um, so to answer your question, no, that information okay. is not but on our soon, current website. But soon. It will be on our new okay. website. So right now, the way you would find that information is going to um, keepitparadise.com, which is where we have all of our um, businesses that have signed up to get a business license. All of that information is listed there, but it's a separate website. It's is keep, where? Keepitparadise.com. Keep, keep it. it Paradise? Mm -hmm. And yep. then what's make it? So we need to get rid of all these things. People don't know that. Right. And I refuse so, to go yeah. to them. You know, so, okay. <laughs> understood. I mean, it's just really confusing when you try sure. and deal with the town of Paradise and, oh, yeah. it's this one or it's yeah. that one. I no, understand. I yeah, serious. so Keep It Paradise um, it really is a pre-fire website that we had for, specifically for business licenses um, because our current website is difficult to manipulate okay. to be able to add that information. Okay. But with our new website, that will all be integrated. So, so that's an on our point. town of Paradise website, is there a link there? that says if you want business information, go here? Yes, there okay. is. All right. um, but on our new website, it will all, It'll be, all be integrated onto no, the I, website. I get that. Yeah. I, I can't wait for that. Hopefully yes. that'll happen soon. Yes. Uh, the, my question was, all these businesses that are coming to town, we have a lot of contractors renting empty building space. We got people setting up, uh, food trucks setting up. And I know this an issue came up last year. Um, are they all signing up for garbage service, providing porta potties or whatever the hand washing stations are we requiring that because we had a i think they had to pay 25 bucks or something to get a permit to to do things so i know we were gonna we were gonna make them all get compliant yes. with the new year do you know if that's happening yes so any business um that is is operating in that way they would need to get a temporary use permit um susan can talk a little bit more oh, okay. about that i didn't realize she was um, but and then for food trucks as well that's another issue that will come up um later today that susan will present to you on okay thank you mm -hmm. Clip, do we have a 
like an estimate of when the website is going to <laughs> happen. And the reason I ask is even today I got a call. I can't find anything on the website. I don't like it. So. Yes, that's a great question. Um, and we, our goal is to launch March 1st. Perfect. Okay. This year. Yes, 2021. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and right. Good clarification. Remind me again who's designing the website for us. I'm sure we are utilizing MuniCode. <laughs> Um, that is a company that designs websites. They also do our um, agendas. So um, when you go onto our current website and, and they make the current agendas and minutes that are- Who is it? And our municipal code. And our municipal code. They also host the municipal code Who is online. It? It's called MuniCode. Oh. That's the name of the company. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Colette. I don't think Thank it's you. right to show us Joy Lynn's candy and not have any. Well, <laughs> it was a good picture though. There you go. No, no, no. That's not joint. That's not candy, I know. So item 1F, biomass research to date from Butte County Fire Safe Council. Yes, good evening. So my job is just to introduce our speakers who are calling in over the phone. We have Jim Houtman, uh, Fuels Reduction in Timber and Biomass Project Manager. And we have Callie Jane DeAnda, who is the Executive Director of the Butte County Fire Safe Council. And I will be advancing their slides and would like to welcome them, welcome them into the meeting. Hey, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to join you all this evening. Um, please bear with me as I just connect with the technology so that I can uh, be sure to see the slides as they're advancing. And um, I'll be able to do that just a second. Uh, we have been working with the town for a number of years, uh, all the way back to some of the, the original uh, 1998 and 99 time frames when we really thought that the fire history in the town was um, was something that the that fire never come into the town. The surrounding areas have been uh, threatened, and so here we are, so many years later, unfortunately, dealing with this issue. Um, I have been serving with the Fire State Council the last 15 years as executive director and really um, I'm encouraged by all the work that you are doing in recovery. I wish that our conversation was only um, geared toward fuels reduction and um, fire prevention planning, <laughs> but unfortunately we're having this conversation. And so um, I I'm just wanna make sure we have a little delay on our site. We can advance to the next slide. Oops. And so, um, but we are, I'm sorry guys, the, the, the YouTube um, is going a little slower than the real time. So I'm just gonna follow along, along on another um, real time version of the PowerPoint. So bear with me if there's a little bit of a confusion here to have these two screens up. So we're advancing to slide two. And slide two is the mission of the Fire State Council. We formed in 1998 as a nonprofit grassroots organization to provide safety in Duke County through our hazard mitigation, education, and now we've added recovery to our mission because it's um, unfortunately so needed. The next slide. So Callie Jane, I am hearing you and I am advancing. So even if you're watching YouTube, which is a couple of seconds behind, just know that I'm moving the slides as you're speaking. Okay, great. All right, I'll just, I'll just continue along. <laughs> Thank you and I apologize to the for everyone. Um, so the one thing I wanted to share with council members is that we have um, created what, what we're titling the pre and post fire WUI action plan. WUI stands for Wild and Urban Interface. And the next picture, if, um, if you're seeing, shows the map of Butte County with our, our Wild and Urban Interfaces outlined by ridge top. And so what we what we'd like to do with the town is participate in this planning process. This is just a, a commercial, a, a info commercial before the power map. Don't worry, we're going to spend the bulk of the time on that. But I wanted to let you know our hope is to be working with the county department heads. We have a meeting with them next week, as well as Cal Fire and Forest Service and the, many other collaborators that we've worked with all these years to really get some action steps. What the, the gray shadowing in this map shows the areas burned collectively by the 2008 um, 2018 and 2017 wildfires, which is most of the county. <laughs> and so the next slide shows where we have um, the, the post-fire areas that need a specific set of 
um, type of work and recovery, and then where the pre-fire areas are that we may still have time to thin those forests and harden those homes and protect structures um, prior to any more catastrophic wildfire. We have a, our estimate at this point is around, let's just say, 700 structures left in the bulk of those rich communities, which is not very much. And in the areas that have not yet burned, we're looking at around, let's just say, 6,000 structures just to round it up, um, which is predominantly Megalia. And so when we look at the task of helping Cohasset, Orchestown, et cetera, um, there's some hope that perhaps we can make some progress. Uh, so I just want to share with you all this planning process is underway, and we would welcome um, the town to be participating with us. This is a, you know, we already all have the local hazard mitigation plan and general plans and a community welfare protection plan. There's lots of plans, but this is about really taking action. The next slide is just a, another commercial info moment on the success that we are already working on with you as a town for a forest management plan for the full town jurisdiction, as well as the southern area outside the town boundary for a future field reduction for spread fire and other types of activities. And um, you've heard a presentation specific on that. I just want to let you know things are coming along well, and we appreciate um, all the participation. At this point in time, I am going to um, hand the reins over to Jim Hauptman, who has been leading the charge on the biomass and He'll be able to explain why it is so essential. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And next slide. So what we've done um, with a lot of research and, and trying to figure out what to do with all the biomass after the campfire and other bear fire, we've been utilizing um, some work in uh, up above Magalio and Cootalink and Hub Cootalink Road with a program, a grant called My Sierra Woods. Um, and we would do the same type of version of ours where we go out and thin private property parcels and uh, create a biomass and bring that to a biomass facility and utilize that biomass to create hydrogen. Um, we are working on with several, several different um, vendors right now to try to find out the best uh, technology to use and working with locations and um, haul distances and markets for the hydrogen and all those things that go into that. Next slide, please. Um, so that's what we've been doing. And, and for a facility of the size that we're looking at, um, it would create an opportunity for us to, uh, to thin about 2,500 to 5,000 acres a year to feed the facility, depending on how big a facility we use. Um, with that, we would use the additional funds of the revenue from that to treat another 10,000 acres in our community um, of Butte County. Next slide, please. These would be uh, using um, mastication, grazing, hand cut and chip, prescribed fire, and lop and scatter. And here's some of the goats that are up in the, um, working up in POA. We uh, have been utilizing them around our community um, quite a lot. They're very efficient and everybody likes to see them. Next slide, please. So the beauty of a hydrogen, a biomass of hydrogen facility is we can be located pretty much anywhere. We can be out in the forest, we can be near a community, we can be along the highway to create hydrogen for fueling stations. Again, we're looking at um, facilities that run anywhere from 120 to 300 bone dry tons a day. That's um, probably in the vicinity of five to 10 trucks of chips per day. That cre creates um, hydrogen. Uh, the cost of the facility is quite a lot, but it does create um, a revenue stream that not only pays for itself, but helps us do other things in our community. It operates 24 seven, 360 days a year. Those extra 10 days are for maintenance. And depending on the size of the facility, what we want to do with it, where we put it, it can take up anywhere from five to 20 acres. The beauty of it is it creates 85 plus jobs, not only at the facility, but out in the forest uh, in our communities where we're actually doing work. Next slide, please. Again, uh, the community benefits are the jobs created for thinning the forest, um, safer communities, evacuation routes, 100 foot defensible space, uh, education, home hardening, and wildfire preparedness for our community. It creates the healthy forest that we all need um, and are looking for the watershed restoration and meadow restoration. Um, and then the last part is what California has been working on is the carbon capture 
it produces a clean green hydrogen. currently right now hydrogen they're using or they're it's coming from natural gas. they're using they're breaking off the the hydrogen off the natural gas um which isn't very uh earth friendly and then um helps with the carbon mitigation for all of california. next slide the bar state council we have a couple different community uh committees and one of those is the biomass and forest health working group and we have been having monthly meetings we did not have a meeting in december or january but we'll have another one in, in uh, february and uh you can go to the fire state council and look under membership under their web page and um sign up and get information on all those committees Are there any questions i have one I, i'm excited about this this is um I think this is a great opportunity, but I know we have a bio, had a bio, biomass down in Oroville, and they had issues with storing the chips for their their facilities. It, it was um, it'd catch on fire at times. Is there is that mitigated? Do we have a, a way of t taking care of that now? Yeah, and one of the things that we looked at is how do we take care of this so that there isn't an issue. Um, what we've talked about is each ridge that we would have, we would have some type of um, facility in the field, and then we would only bring the chips that we need to the facility in a timely manner. The other part of that is we can leave it, um, cut it, and not have it chipped right away so that it can dry out a little bit, and then we would chip it and bring it to the facility as well. And when it has lower moisture content, it creates um, less weight for the truck so they can actually haul more chips with less weight down the hill uh, to wherever our facility is. That's a great idea. Uh, it, 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 well, we can talk about it later. I, I like it. It's a good idea. Question? How are they going to get rid of all the chips that are coming out of our fire and the Bear Fire and, you know, the 400 million acres that burn? There's no place to take them now. These things won't be built for a while. You don't have enough goats. I would agree with you 100%. Uh, we're looking at a build out time anywhere from uh, 16 to 24 months if we started today and we're not ready to start today. So um, that is the problem. And I, my fear is that out in, in the community um, where people are living, that some of those trees will be mitigated. The rest of the trees will not be mitigated over a course of time and that will create more fire hazard later on. Right. Okay. So what do you need from us at this point? Um, I mean, what, what is your, yeah, um, what is your plan? What can we do to help you? Well, so we've looked at um, numerous uh, opportunities in the community to help out everybody. And, um, you know, I, the idea tonight was just to present the information to you, let you have a chance to think about it, maybe come up with some more questions. If you wanted to partner with us, that would be awesome. We could help facilitate um, getting um, more information to you and moving forward as a, you know, in a, in a group setting, I guess, more, and um, have you as a partner in what we're doing. Have you guys thought about, are you, are, is the Fire Safe Council, are they working at all to help facilitate opening up more cogeneration plants? Or is that like yes, sir, we are. okay? Because that's that's something that could be done quickly to deal with some of this stuff. I mean, you know, if we can open Popeyes back up in Orville, that would be a huge help. Yes, sir. Oh, Kelly, Jane, and Jim, before you go, uh, I have a proclamation here that we're a little tardy in uh, getting uh, to you. Uh, for uh, thanking you for uh, your help during the uh, the campfire, and uh, you've been committed to educating the residents of Butte County and the town of Paradise on wildfire hazard mitigation and recovery. And uh, I promise we will uh, get this to you soon. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, on to item two, consent calendar. One roll call vote is taken for all items. Consent calendars considered to be routine business and it does not call for a discussion. I move for approval. 
second. I'll second. Go ahead. No, go ahead. You spoke. Three. Second. Motion by Boland, seconded by Jones. Roll call vote. Council Member Boland? Aye. Council Member Culliton? Aye. Vice Mayor Jones? Aye. Council Member Tryon? Aye. And Mayor Crowder? Aye. Thank you. Uh, item three, nothing moved. So uh, item four, public communication. Dina, any cards? I have two comments that were emailed in um, regarding public comment. The first one is from Rob Robertson. And he says, why are we still seeing dead trees standing that are close to or over power lines and our main thoroughfares? Pence, Clark, Skyway, Pearson, Billy, Wagstaff. What is the town of Paradise plan for the issues? It seems as though every time I drive throughout the town, I see more areas that trees have had to be pushed out of the roadways and haven't even been properly cleaned up. This is causing rainwater runoff issues as well. And then the next item is from Monica Hutro. Um, this is a follow-up to the comment Ward Habriel submitted in last month's December 8th town council meeting. Ward Habriel stated he believes council should listen to what the people of Paradise want. I am making the same statement he made last month. However, I am adding one more comment and request. Council should not only listen to what the people of Paradise want, but they shall, should allow us to be seen. I am asking the council to open their doors to the public when we come forward with issues or concerns needing to be addressed in a timely manner and handled appropriately and professionally like they should be. This is not happening within the town's government. The Paradise Town Council should make us important and trust us enough when we ask to come forward with information or documents necessary for the Town Council to look at. You will never become strong leaders who successfully advocate for this community if you continue to shut us out and make us feel disrespected and unimportant. We are no different than you, so instead of opposing, ignoring, stonewalling, and failing to respond to multiple and ongoing attempts to get your attention, why not make changes now to do things differently? We aren't being listened to, we are not being heard, and we are not being seen. The town council, the mayor, the manager, all have an obligation to the community members to make time to meet with us, to hear and see what we have to say. I believe this town government needs to change. All letters, all letters mailed, emails sent, and phone calls made for almost the past year went ignored with failed responses to anything. This type of behavior isn't going to help Paradise. It will only continue to hurt it and create liability and toxicity instead of leadership respect and a strong desire to create change in our community. I hope that with the new leadership, even though some of you have already been held, have already held positions in the past, that you will start by caring enough to create significant change for this town and its members and genuinely do everything in your power to make Paradise a better, healthier, and safer place to live. Members of our community have a constitutional right to have the town redress any grievances brought forward, especially when it has to do with violations of the law or information critical for the town council to be made aware of and act on. That's not happening here in Paradise. Stonewalling community members, avoiding them, ignoring them, and failing to honor our rights is not in any way going to create a strong community. It will only create animosity, disdain, resentment, and distrust. Change for the better won't happen unless we have heard have unless we are heard and seen. If all of you continue to purposely turn a blind eye to the serious matters being brought to your attention, why even be on a council government? What's your real purpose here if it's not for us? Monica, Monica Hutro. Those are the only two comments that I received via email, and there were no phone calls. No, I disagree with all that, but okay. Just for the record. Uh, all right, uh, curious. Do we know what the issues are with this individual? I, 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 I do. Okay. And, and I may not. So has, but we have responded to this individual? We, we have a uh, okay. Warren Gill and a letter, a uh, very good letter, uh, responding individual at a meeting with the um, Our police chief has gotten involved, and to all stem from civil, he is happy that the town will needs to be decision has been okay thank you okay
Okay. Item six, council consideration. Consider accepting the after action report and uh, this by uh, Simmons. Have not had time to miss me. Um, <laughs> good evening again. So I am pleased to present council uh, the after action report, which was included in its full length in the um, council packet. What I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about the project itself and about the highlights in terms of the findings. So just covering really quickly um, how the after action report was put together, the findings and goals of the report, and how and when we will implement it, which we, I'm pleased to report, have already started to do. Uh, so who developed the after action report? Constant Associates is a third party that was hired, actually at the recommendation of one of our council members. They did the after action report for the county and signed on to do the after action report for the town. Um, Constant and Associates worked very closely with a number of stakeholders in town, conducted surveys, facil facilitated group discussions, and ultimately produced the after action report. So what is an after action report? Um, it is, its meaning really is to collect and share information from the Town of Paradise's perspective regarding response and recovery, recovery efforts um, from the campfire. It documents uh, both lessons learned as well as be best practices and hopes that the findings in the after action report can be utilized by other communities who are looking to avoid disaster or who are recovering. And the after action report also celebrates a lot of the um, amazing work put in by town staff, town officials, community members in terms of the, the heroic efforts uh, made during the campfire. So it is a document of celebration as well as a document of lessons and learning and opportunity. So the after action report was developed, as I mentioned, really as a guiding document, uh, particularly with the corrective action plan, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. But um, it really helps us look at that very specified period of time between November 8th, uh, 2018 and December 15th, 2018, um, and kind of looking at what occurred very specifically during that time period so that they could extract these objectives that the town is now recommended to follow. So a couple of themes that the after action report highlights, uh, notification alert and warning, evacuation, EOC operations, interagency coordination, public information and continuity of government. So essentially the categories you would expect us to be looking at very closely when we study our um, response to a disaster. So the strengths are really highlighted as I mentioned in the after action report and what I was going to talk about in my slides today um, because it, as I said, it's a, it's a very lengthy report are really the areas of improvement um, because they vary widely. And I wanted to specify a couple of things that we've already started to work on with our partners. So in notification alert and warning recommendations, we're really talking about coordinating and testing mass notification efforts. We're talking about thresholds for issuing evacuation orders and making sure we have two redundant methods for is issuing evacuation orders and warnings and really documenting all plans and procedures and trainings and policies. So you'll see throughout the document that with every objective is really a recommendation that we document all of this for future use. In evacuation recommendations, uh, they're really talking about making sure we stay up on new technologies for maintaining situational awareness, um, looking at a regional evacuation plan. I know Mark mentioned that in his transportation master plan. Um, really making sure we look at worst case scenario disasters uh, on a regular basis and making sure we keep st town staff aware. As you all know, town staff has really turned over quite a bit from the campfire just for you know retirements and, and changes. And of course, I'm relatively new. So we wanna make sure that town staff is really well trained and really well prepared and that we're, kind of, we're thinking as a team and prepared for another disaster. And making sure, of course, that we're prepared for folks with disability access and functional needs. For emergency operations center recommendations, making sure we have multi-level staffing systems in place. So as we all know, council members certainly and town staff were personally impacted by the fire. And so when we talk about our response, we wanna make sure that we have backup for um, all of our staffing systems to make sure that we're utilizing volunteers, we're utilizing EMMA teams as early as possible, and we're taking some of the pressure off of staff and town officials who are responding. 
Also looking at the opportunity for joint mission capable EOC facilities throughout the county. So this could be a jointly uh, located uh, EOC between the county and the town of Paradise, for example, or a jointly uh, a unified command um, between some of the jurisdictions. So we've already begun these conversations with the city of Chico and will with the county soon. So for interagency coordination recommendations, there's a lot in the after action report about animal control policies and procedures, making sure that we bring before council um, some opportunities really for better control over this aspect of disaster management, um, looking at ways to better uh, create communication pathways for shelter updates between county EOC and affected towns and cities, and those types of things. So for public information recommendations, these are obviously really, really critical. We know whatever information leaves the town is, is being utilized in a state of emergency, so it's highly critical. Um, we, of course, noticed during the, the North Complex fire that it's not only putting out accurate information, it's correcting inaccurate information on social media and as we hear about it in the public. So it's a multi-pronged approach. Um, looking at PIO best practices, making sure we have several staff prepared to serve in the P multiple PIOs or if we need to um, replace a PIO for any reason. Making sure, again, we have those staffing augmentation plans in place, utilizing trained volunteers and mutual aid. Um, unity of public messaging is absolutely critical. Um, as we talked about in evacuation a couple of slides back, this is obviously 100% critical for issuing evacuation warning, warnings and orders but also unity of public messaging within the town. So this involves council members, it involves town staff, um, and we are preparing to do some trainings on uh, unity of public messaging to make sure that we're prepared for um, being a unified uh, agency should the next disaster arise. Continuity of government, uh, obviously looking at the town's ability to access critical information if we're removed from our EOC or have to relocate for some reason making sure that we have a plug and play IT system ready to go, that if we have to uh, mobilize and, and move our EOC, that we're able to just plug into Wi-Fi and have access to our central databases that would be stored in the cloud and all of that. Um, looking at a memorandum of agreement with local housing providers to provide temporary housing to town officials. So again, town staff, town officials were personally impacted by the fire. So while they're concurrently working in the EOC, they're also trying to secure housing for their families. And so that puts some additional pressure on town staff and those who are responding to the fire. Uh, providing mental and behavioral health resources, obviously a top priority, wanting to make sure we're supporting those who are supporting others going through a disaster and making sure after the fact that they have the, the appropriate resources for uh, sort of handling trauma uh, after a disaster. So the corrective action plan is a document that sort of lives within the after action report. And the corrective action plan contains a list of something like 80 plus objectives that uh, we have looked at and have categorized into what you see here. So the corrective action plan we've categorized into regional planning. So this is where we look at evacuation, mapping, sheltering, communications, internal, external, technology, training, again, that documentation, updating the plan, and then EOC staffing, roles and responsibilities, physical location, succession, and more. Um, and what I wanted to share with you is that we've already begun to implement their corrective action plan. We did have our first joint meeting with the city of Chico this week. This was a, a conversation between um, town and city management, emergency management departments. Um, we had public works departments, we had fire, we had police, and we were all having a conversation looking very specifically at the objectives outlined in the corrective action plan so that the city of Chico is seeing what we're seeing and understanding why we're requesting their collaboration on implementing a lot of these. We have a similar meeting planned with Butte County for Thursday of this week. And then um, we're going to be looking at sort of consolidating all, consolidating all of this with the town of Paradise really leading the way um, for regional collaboration on the objectives and the corrective action plan because as we know, the town of Paradise has the most to gain and the most to lose obviously with regional collaboration when it comes to emergency management because of the vulnerabilities within our community. And so uh, my thought was, uh, as their corrective, corrective action plan is implemented, and Jim Brashears and I have sort of stamped a two-year uh, mark on the plan with most of the objectives planned to be implemented before the next fire season, 
um, is to bring our progress on the corrective action plan implementation to council in my monthly disaster recovery updates. So like advocacy, you have a really good understanding of how we're working regionally with the county, how we're working with the city of Chico, um, what we've identified um, from the corrective action plan that we can implement right away. Um, it does involve not only the town internally, we have an emergency management team, but it involves um, sort of the well-trenched emergency planning teams uh, down at the county and obviously working with the city of Chico. So there's a lot of meetings, a lot of you know conversation going on there, but um, the plan is to bring those regular updates to the council. <laughs> So I can do my best to answer any questions on the preparation of the after action report, on the report itself, or the corrective action plan. I don't have any questions, but um, you know, I, I love what I see here that we're we're collaborating with other jurisdictions that we're looking at this to get ourselves. You're right. We have a lot of new staff. If this happened right now would be would be brand new to us, so we need to be thinking, talking. But I hope we also maybe on a yearly basis, bring this to the council as to what the council's role when something comes up. Because when we, when we had this happen, there was, there was a lot of stuff that came out. The council didn't know what to do and there was things that were said and stuff on social media that came out that you know, wasn't consistent with everybody. And I think it's important that this council understands its role going forward in all the councils and knows what what's expected of the council in those situations, how we get stuff out. We're not, we're not the sole person to get it out. There's, there's a collaborative attempt to get the same information out, accurate information, and that way you're not spending time having to correct all that kind of stuff. So um, we learned a lot, and I hope that happens like on a yearly basis so we can talk about it and be ready for something to happen. So we've actually prioritized that training and Jim Brashears and Colette are putting that together. So that training for council members is coming forward in the next couple months, a month or two. Um, so, so that training will be coming forward to council. Um, we've talked about potentially conducting that during orientation or during the sort of the, um, you know, on, on an annual basis, I definitely hear what you're saying. So Jim Brashears does teach this, this council member sort of elected official training throughout the region. And so he is customizing this for the town and that will be coming forward as one of our first corrective action plan implementations. Cause I we hear you absolutely. it great to bring it here on a yearly yeah. basis. We talk about it, reminds us when something comes up. Part of that's public information. Public information. Should yep. be, should be. Good. Excellent. And then town staff will be trained similarly to make sure that we have public information coming out of the designated staff and that we all have other roles and responsibilities and we're deferring to the PIO for that public information. And I feel like that culture has already been well established in town in terms of managing PR on a regular day-to-day -day basis. And so it's just making sure that that's really, uh, we're really prepared for that for a disaster. So I got a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Part of all this stuff that's going on, I know, um, I think that we need to be involved somehow. Like all these meetings that staff is having, developing a plan, we don't, I just want a report of it. I want to be involved in it. Or I think that somebody elected by the people should be part of developing what that plan is, rather than be told, well, here's a plan we developed for you. Before the 2008 fires, we did a lot of training with the EOC, the whole thing, staff, council, and Jim taught us all about a whole bunch of stuff. So all of that stuff is being put in place is good. Um, but I think that, that we need to be a part of this whole thing. This report is great that they did, but nobody from the public was involved in it. The idea that we're gonna, one of the key points is we'll develop an EOC and we'll have community members and backups. Okay, I'd like to see that be more involved. I mean, I'm a little leery of just staffs, whether it's our staff, Chico staff, the county staff, making all the decisions without the elected officials, the, the people's representatives being part of that decision making or that planning. Hmm. So Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I guess just an opportunity to clarify the plan has already been written. And so our role is just implementing the plan. But I absolutely I think you're saying something more than that. Being a part of, of how it's implemented. Yeah. I yeah. mean okay. you know it's great we're gonna get a report, you know, but but when you all are sitting down there with the county officials next week or something if any of us are available or want to be there, it might be interesting to hear who else is there. You know, I mean, uh, I think I think one of the 
things we have to realize too is there's a separation, right? There's a separation between council and there's a and there's a staff level. And right now we're in the staff level part of that. The training that will come forward, you'll have the opportunity to be trained in your role when it does come to emergency so, operations. So, so is it not? Let me, let me correct me if I'm wrong. Is it not our position as the elected officials? To give the direction to staff if we're not a part of if we don't have any i mean we got the report we've read what the, the recommendations are so so now it's like how are we going to implement that or how are we going to develop that plan i mean we don't have any role in that i guess i have a different perspective um our role as elected officials is to make policy it's not to actually implement that policy, and I would expect that you and Katie would bring any policy questions to this board, but I don't think it's my role to actually be involved in the implementation. That's not what an elected official is supposed to do. <laughs> we'll just, and, and, and I agree with that. And tonight, you, you guys, you guys have disagree. the plan, so, so if you guys don't want to accept the plan or the implementation or how the plan is asking to be implemented. Right, yeah, that's what we do now. Well, so, but I don't, I mean, other than what's written here, there's this report tonight, other than what I was given to read, what I've read and what I see what the recommendations are. So now you've gone and had one meeting, going to go have another meeting. And whatever is decided there, you know, then you're going to bring back and that's going to be the plan. And then I can just say yay yeah or nay to that. And that's my only role. Huh? So I guess, um, hmm. I'm just thinking about just specifically for the city of Chico meeting, for example, as we, we took the correction, corrective action plan objectives in the after action report to the city, and we, we asked for their cooperation in the couple of items that we were taking a look at. For example, um, you know, perhaps a joint EOC facility. We did move our EOC down to the city of Chico, for example, during the disaster. So it's, it's really just technical and logistical in terms of, you know, send us your roles and responsibility for your EOC. We'll send you ours. We'll make sure we have phone numbers. We'll make sure that all of our first responders are talking. So it's really just sort of, it's really more of that. And then, as I said, for example, with like the animal control, that definitely will require some policy discussion and that will be brought forth to council. And it does actually say in the after action report, it's recommended that we bring that forward to our policymakers. So That's when you took this EOC operational guideline or whatever the town of paradise is, do we all have that also? Have we all seen that? Or is that on the web page or whatever? Well, I don't know, whatever you oh, went and shared with them, plan. this technical information. I mean, do we, you know, if you, if you, if, you just said that part of that meeting was we went to the city of Chico and we talked about some technical stuff like sharing an EOC down there. And so we showed them our EOC operational plan. Yeah, no, it was just a discussion. Yeah, it was just a discussion. So what okay. we did is we talked through the after action report and we said, here's a list of things we feel we need to be collaborating on. It wasn't anything more in, okay. more in depth than this introductory meeting, honestly, than the town of Paradise really being proactive in terms of communicating what our objectives are following the lessons that we learned from the campfire. So you know, there's a lot that, that CAL FIRE does directly with FIRE. There's a lot that PD does between PD and then BCSO and OEM and all of that. So there's this whole universe of people who are already communicating. And we have this opportunity really with lessons learned to be coming forward and saying, here's our priorities in the yeah. plan. And I guess my point, and I understand what Greg and Jody are saying. My point is when citizens ask me, well, what, what are you doing when mm -hmm. they see this document mm -hmm. that is a public document? Yep. And I say, I don't know. You know, and and before, when when PD had, you know, they our police chief would explain to us as individual council members mm -hmm. what their relationship was with the county or with the city or other sure. other jurisdictions. So we understood what what some of that stuff. We mm -hmm. we understood what the breakdowns were. CHP controls the state highway. They you know the roadblock mm -hmm. there. I mean, th those are the lessons we learned on the 08 mm -hmm. fire. So that's the kind of information that is an elected official. That I, when a citizen asks me what's going on, I'd like to be able to tell them. Yeah, that's so that could be something we talk about in the training, just in terms of the different roles and responsibilities. But I think. Um, yeah. And then. Okay. Yeah. I just, and I'll, okay. 
Oh, sorry, sorry. I will say that we do have an emergency operations plan, um, which is the after action report. The CAP is definitely recommending that we update. So there will be a lot of documentation and, and updating of our existing plan. So when, when you're talking about plans, there is the emergency operations plan as well. And that's separate from the corrective action plan, which is just implement the lessons you learned from the campaign. I understand, but as, as, mem as elected officials, and I don't know if Greg got this and Jody and, and Steve got this before I know, uh, if there is a, a, an EOC plan uh, and we are members or parts of the EOC operation as elected officials, then, then do, I, I mean, I, you know, do we got a handbook. Is it in that handbook? Is it something, is it a document that we have access to? Yep. I mean, if, if we should, if, if it's something we're a part of, you know, I mean, I think the, training the role clear, that but... council would play in that will be covered in this training, yeah. won't it? Yep, that's correct. And it's going to be a supportive If there's role. a plan, yes. I'd like to be able to see it. Not a, it's not a lead uh, role. I've seen it. So it's a limited role. It it's not a lead role that we play. It's a supportive role, and that's, that's what we'll be learning about. Yes. Two quick questions. Um, there was a survey that was given. Can you tell me who who the survey went out to, because it does seem like there was some feedback in the form of a survey. So I believe this survey is included at the end of the after action report, and it does have some methodology information associated with the survey that it did go out kind of internally. So that was not a community wide survey. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So there was some, there was a feedback loop. And yes. then um, I noticed that we're working with the city of Chico. Um, and I guess my question would be also working with the, the city of Oroville because I think a lot of our people sort of split yep. in two different directions. And is that gonna be part of the process at some point also? Yes, so um, what we've done with the corrective action plan objective is really look at what agencies will be involved and some are kind of Paradise and County and some are Paradise County and Chico. And then we go beyond that and we even go beyond that to a multi-county region definitely when it comes to evacuation mapping, for example. So each one of the objectives and you see them in the after action report, we have to look at who will be implementing this. And in some cases it will be county, you know, all of us together and then just the county as a whole and then the multi-county region. So definitely looking at who the partners will be in terms of um, regional collaboration for sure. And then Kevin has done a lot um, just of outreach to the, the jurisdictional leaders just to kind of uh, make those connections and, and help us get the uh, Paradise's interest in regional collaboration out for sure around emergency management. Perfect, thank yep. you. Yep. Any other questions? Tina, any <laughs> cards? Okay, before you need we... approval, Thanks, I move approval. Adoption, yes. Adoption. It says accepting. Oh, accepting. So we're just accepting, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. I move acceptance of. <laughs> I'll <the> second. <laughs> Aye. 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 Thank you. Before we move on to item 6B, uh, we're going to take a five minute break. It's cold in here, huh? Yeah, I am too. That's sure. So I'm going to suggest that these reports be written. Your microphone is still on, so don't. I know. I'm moving away.
By the door, She's... Oh, the side door. Okay. Oh, that goes. Oh, coming up here. This is. I read all this. Stuff. Six. No, I, I think. I, no. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I got moved around. Room. Okay. This is. There's no way, Kevin. No way. This is no way. Well, uh, six B. Six B. Let's let's go ahead and. Uh, 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 take it back now. Let's go ahead and resume, move on to item uh, 6B. Can you really speak in your microphone, please? People are having a hard time hearing you. Thank you. We'll move to uh, on to item 6B and uh, several parts to this. First one's uh, considering authorizing the town manager to execute an agreement with the city of Chico uh, regarding the uh, sewer um, connection and uh, is uh, thank you that Mark or Kevin? Mark. Oh, it's Mark. So I need to recuse myself because of the part of the we're talking about the sewer, so I have to step out of this because the FPPC can't. Mark, good evening again. Good evening, Council. Thank you for introducing the item, Mayor Crowder. Um, we will go ahead and pick this item up from the December 8th Council meeting where the Town Council uh, voted to move forward with the Environmental Impact Report Phase 2 with the work uh, being completed by HDR Engineering. This Environmental Impact Report is funded in part through three different grants, being an $800,000 grant from the state $172,000 through USDA and a $1.7 million uh, State Water Board Division of Financial Assistance grant to go ahead and move forward to the EIR with a regional solution with a direct connection to the City of Chico's Water Pollution Control Plant. So with that said, um, moving forward, um, we have a couple of action items before you tonight and one of those is to approve a cooperative work agreement between the town of paradise and city of chico a draft agreement has been included in the agenda packet and it sets aside at three hundred thousand um, dollars that's made available to the city of chico to undertake a specific scope of work as a vendor to the town of paradise 
Um, this work includes uh, current and future uh, flow and load analysis at their treatment plant, hydraulic uh, capacity evaluation, uh, process modeling of future facilities, evaluation of alternatives for regulatory requirements and capacity improvements, modified uh, water pollution control plant facility planning report, and then formulating a project connection fee analysis uh, for the town uh, to connect to their plant. The intent of this grant funding is to ensure that no city of Chico expenses are being subsidized by their existing ratepayers for the purposes of exploring a new potential uh, connection from the town and that the technical analysis and operational input from city of Chico staff will be utilized in the EIR as required in the California Environmental Quality Act uh, CEQA to evaluate impacts of such project and propose appropriate mitigation for these impacts. So with that, uh, we've proposed a, an agreement to outline how the city of Chico will perform this work and hire their own consultants, use their own staff to do this work in partnership with the town's EIR. And uh, we are seeking for conceptual approval and authorization for the town manager to execute this agreement once it's been approved by the city of Chico and their department. Um, I'm getting a little bit of feedback on my side. I just want to make sure and, and pause that you guys can all hear me okay. Uh, we can hear you. You sound Mark. fine. Okay, great. I'll keep going forward. Okay, so um, also one of the takeaways from our last action item was um, the need for a project committee um, with representation Mark, from the town of Mark, Paradise. Mark, hang on one sec. Jody's. Before you go on, I was just going to suggest that we take each of these things one at a time. Okay. So um, I'd like to recommend um, that the council do number one, and then we'll go on to your presentation for number two. Okay. Are there any questions uh, relating to the cooperative work agreement, a draft which has passed an internal legal review um, and an initial first glance from other uh, stakeholders is included in the agenda packet. I'd be glad to answer any questions relating to the agreement. But any costs um, that the town of Herod, or that the city of Chico incurs relating to this defined scope of work will be billed to the town, and then the town will pay the city back, and then the town will request reimbursement for the city's expenses uh, from there. So okay. we are an intermediary, and that is out of necessity, rather uh, because we are the grantee uh, by the state uh, division of uh, financial assistance. Are we voting on each one? Is that what you're asking for? Mm -hmm. So moved. Questions? questions any? Oh, I don't have any, any questions. Any cards? I have no cards on this item. I move approval of number one. Second. Oh. Motion by Jones, seconded by Colton. Thank you. <laughs> you um, forgot. Roll call vote. <laughs> Council Member Bolin is absent. Councilmember Colleton? Aye. Vice Mayor Jones? Aye. Councilmember Tryon? Aye. And Mayor Crowder? Aye. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Council. So moving forward to uh, the second action item is, um, is in general, uh, we identified a need for a project committee that consists of elected officials and staff uh, facilitated, facilitated by the uh, regional board and um, this really aims to address the many questions ranging from detailed technical components to broad regional policies which need to be handled through the EIR preparation and the project uh, advancement. So to help facilitate these discussions, again, the Water Board is proposing to facilitate the project committee um, with representation from both the city, of town, city and town. We are seeking uh, for two elected officials to be named to this committee tonight. And it'll provide a also a public venue for ongoing project progress and partnership with updates coming back to both councils at large at large in regular intervals. So um, I will go ahead and pause here. And also I will note that the city of Chico will be considering number one and number two um, in their regular council meeting agenda on February 2nd. It appears their um, January 19th meeting has been canceled or this item has been moved. I believe the entire meeting has been canceled, uh, but uh, these two items will be considered um, and presented from town staff and city staff uh, on, on February 2nd. 
So with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions about the committee and need for two council members to be named to represent um, the town. I would be interested in doing it if, if no one else is. I'd like to recommend that um, the mayor and myself be the two people. And the reason that I'd like to recommend that is that I've worked on this project since 2014. I think I've been the driving force for many years for it. And um, the mayor and I are the only two people left since Councilman Bolin cannot participate in this who have the history. And I do think that it's appropriate for the mayor to be on this committee. I'm gonna recommend that, uh, that Rose you be appointed to the committee because I think it's good that we have some new some new blood on the committee. I was on the council when we dealt with the sewer way back when, a couple of times, and uh, the mayor's involved in a whole lot of things, and, and I know that this committee, both you and Rose, if, if uh, unless you want to give your seat up to, to the mayor, um, will report to us whatever's going on in the committee. In a, in a, in a, in a, I just think it would be nice to have some new people representing this. It, I, I've been as a stakeholder before I was even on the council uh, with this, and uh, I, I think I, I really want to be a part of this. I've been at, at it from the beginning, and uh, I, I kind of I want to continue on. So, but you own property in the thing, same as Greg. You just don't own I, as much. I own one piece. I know, but you, and I've been cleared by the FDC. I, I know, I understand. So, I'm just saying. I'm just okay. saying. Well, I'll yeah. make a motion that the the representatives be the mayor and myself. I'll second. Motion by Jones, seconded by Crowder, for the representatives to be Mayor Crowder and Councilmember Jones. Roll call vote. Councilmember Bolin is absent. Councilmember Culleton? No. Council, or Vice Mayor Jones? Yes. Councilmember Tryon? I'll vote yes. And Mayor Crowder? Yes. So the two representatives that will sit on the committee will be Mayor Crowder and Council Member and Vice Mayor Jones. All right. Sorry, I had to take myself off mute there. So um, to close out the agenda item, Assemblyman James Gallagher has introduced Assembly Bill 36 design build contracting, uh, which has a direct benefit to the Paradise Sewer Project. AB 36 authorizes the Town of Paradise to utilize design build for construction of a sewer treatment work system, including collection and transmission to the City of Chico Water Pollution Control Plant. The option, and again, I have to emphasize uh, the word option there, to utilize design build contracting could expedite project delivery and reduce project costs. Uh, staff is recommending the town council authorize the town mayor to sign a sponsorship letter in support of AB 36, and that letter has been included in your agenda packet as well. Um, so outside of that, I just did want to report that all three of these items don't um, do not have uh, any new financial impacts to the town of Paradise, and all of these um, efforts are coming through grant funds that we have secured. And I'd be glad to answer any questions relating to the AB 36 proposal. And, and also, there is a part of that bill that also includes a pipeline from PID uh, down to Chico, but they are two separate projects. So it isn't that both have to be done as as part of this this bill but they are both in that bill so i just want to make that clear yes thank you for that i appreciate um that context there definitely is uh verbiage in there to benefit pid for a potential project as well um, but again neither of um neither of these depend on the other which is good news so we need a motion yes yes i'll move uh that we instruct the town mayor to write a letter, sign a sponsorship letter for Assemblyman Gallagher on the bill he's putting through. I second. second it. Okay, who, who gets the second? I got it. Okay. Motion by Councilmember Culleton, 
Seconded by Council Member Tryon. Roll call vote. Mayor Bowen is absent. Council Member Culleton? Aye. Vice Mayor Jones? Aye. Council Member Tryon? Aye. And Mayor Crowder? Aye. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. All right, thank you, Council. Thanks, Mark. Miss you. <laughs> so, on to uh, item C. I like it. Um, in light of the unique qualification knowledge management partner, staff request council to consider the approval, the sole source procurement of financial services, and uh, our town manager, Kevin Phillips, will speak on this. Yes, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Good evening, council. Um, so quickly, I'm just going to run through kind of why we need this uh, service, uh, where we are currently, where we were before the fire, where we are currently, um, kind of the uh, the the factors that can affect um, our financial stability and then what uh, management partners are is going to do for the town so manager manager can you just hold up the microphone that way people can hear you <laughs> it, it he's, comes he's off too it tall comes off. There you go. okay is Thank that you. better there you Thank go you. all right <laughs> so pre-fire budget uh, approximately about 12 million dollars um, you can see where the majority of our our income came from property tax then down from sales tax uh, and then from gas and then into the gas tax. So after the fire, um, again, this was our budget this year also because our, we had backfill from the, uh, from the state on the property tax. Our sales tax, measure C tax, gas tax all did drop um, during that time, but our property tax did sit, stay the same. So. Uh, estimate for our next current budget is about $5 million, which leaves a budget gap of almost $7 million. So looking at that, our operational expense pretty much stays flat. Um, and uh, the assumptions that I'm making right here for a break even in about 20 years is our operational expense will increase 1% a year. That's pretty low. Um, operational revenue increasing 5.5% through that time, so pretty high. A lot of assumptions to get us back to that uh, portion of that. Here's kind of the revenue gaps associated with those assumptions. It's $82 million over that, that time period. So remember back uh, when we first received these funds, we did kind of make an estimate of where we thought those revenue gaps were going to support the town. 67% of it was gonna go to the critical public services. So that would be those revenue gaps that we were looking at just now. Um, hazard mitigation grant funds, cash flow reserves, other town priorities, and then a big portion into that unfunded pension obligation um, side of things. So if all those assumptions happened, we wouldn't actually be good at the end of the year. But those assumptions are, are very difficult to kind of put into context and to, and to monitor. Um, so what is our current process, progress? So here's kind of permits issued over the last what is that, a year and a half? Um, so from May 2019 to January 21, um, you can kind of see that it's actually pretty flat. Um, we've actually had 67 uh, permits issued per month or 104 for the year. And we were kind of thinking after de December of 19 with that big spike, we we're gonna see a kind of a significant drop. But what you can see is it's actually kind of staying flat. But the thing that we don't know is what, what happens after that. So currently we're kind of in that green area where we have that big rebuild process. People are coming back to their lots. They're making decisions. Uh, there's that big push. The orange and the red are those kind of unknowns. The orange kind of represents people that were here that still are unknown if they're going to rebuild with their lot. What are they going to do with their lot? And then the red, the big, big portion that we're going to see is that repopulation, the new people coming up. How are we going to draw those people up? And to be honest, that's where we're going to get that big revenue bump, too, because you have new people coming up. It's a new increase on their property tax base. And now we're going to recover quicker than we would if it was all just rebuilds based on uh, people keeping their property tax base at that level. So what is management partners? Um, well, they developed the model for you guys to secure your funds pro bono. So they already have knowledge of the town. They have a knowledge of what we've gone through and they have a base model of what they built 
to kind of put those numbers in to uh, show PG&E what the, what the loss of the revenue was. They have a unique uh, experience in California government financing consulting. Most all of their consultants uh, had some type of city finance jobs through their careers. Uh, they have a collaborative approach, develop proven methodologies. They tailor it to the town's needs and they just don't look at like the the facts of the case. They look at all services associated with the town and then they kind of give advice on where you can pull back, where you can do things differently, maybe to save some money uh, through the interim. So here's the work plan that they're uh, proposing, a kickoff, an information and data gathering. It's not dates gathering, it's data. Um, develop a long range fiscal forecast. So kind of putting all the numbers together and then develop those strategies, you know, looking at ways we can increase revenue, looking at ways we can shift controls or expenditures, uh, looking at ways we can deliver services differently, maybe to be more efficient, um, and then seeing if there's a, if we need to decrease, decrease services, you know, looking at cutting costs. Um, and through that, they'll explore changes and facilitate a workshop. This workshop will be with the council and with the public. I did. Uh, clarify that Good. Um, and then report results and then this is the big one is implement the financial uh, sustainability action plan so they'll help us implement this they'll have technical support on the on the um, the the model that they'll create and this model will be a, a, something that we can update on a yearly basis we can update it on a monthly basis if we wanted to but this is our model this is something that will be to the town so their fee proposal is not to exceed 7990. Um, that is 450 hours of time spent. Um, with this, I did reach out to another firm that I knew that kind of they're not as qualified, I, I feel, to, to do this, but I know that they do uh, modeling for, for government and for basically uh, for courts and to get uh, for bankruptcy and um, pleadings. And their, their, their fee was double this fee for the same amount of service. So just to let you know that there was kind of a cost check on this. I feel very confident with this, with this number. So that'll take any questions. Do we know what the timeline will be for completion? Oh, yes, uh, approximately six months. Six months? Yep. And just for clarification, this is a one-time fee and then we own the model Yep. and if we ever need them to come back, we can bring their services back, but right. we can implement it from there. Correct. We own the model. We own all the data associated with the model. And we can do the tweaks ourselves. And Correct. And they're going to give us tech support before they leave, so we know how to do the tweaks. Right. Yes. In 20 years, it won't be any good, but we'll figure Hey, we'll out. be recovered in 20 years. There we won't go. need that's it. That's right. That's right. What was I thinking? So we got six months to spend all the money before they tell us how to do it. <laughs> I think this is really important. We don't want to think we have 20 years and we'll be good and then find out at year 15 that we have to lay off half our staff because we overestimated. Yep. We really need to have a handle on this as we go along. I agree. Well, and hopefully we can stretch it beyond 20 years. 20 years is a guess. I mean, we... Right. It's a guess. Yeah, yeah this, this will help us keep that crystal ball a little bit yeah. clearer. Right. That makes sense. And every year we can look at it and say, well, now it's stretching to 22 yeah. years. This will be the main thing that we use for budgeting moving forward of, of our revenue. Any... You need a motion or you have any cards or anything? I have no cards on this item. I move acceptance of this. I'll second. Motion by Bolin, seconded by Crowder. Roll call vote. Councilmember Bolin. Aye. Councilmember Colleton. Aye. Vice Mayor Jones. Aye. Councilmember Tryon. Aye. And Mayor Crowder. Aye. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. And thanks for coming up with another price, too. That, that is yeah. good to and, hear. And don't, don't sit down next, because I think you're up again. So, 60, uh, consider adopting resolution number 2102, a resolution of the Town, of, town Council of the Town of Paradise uh, reporting unex, unexpended development impact fees. Correct. So, the, the town collects these development impact fees in multiple different categories. Um, one of the requirements is to present to the public 
every year the balance of the development impact fees if any of those fees were spent and then the collection of any new fees uh, throughout that time period. Uh, so that's what you have in front of you. Um, there is a report of items that are kind of earmarked for these fees. We feel as a staff that they're probably outdated at this point in time. I know that in the past, these fees were kind of collected because the town didn't have the resources to really dive into some bigger projects. Um, they used them kind of for, for maybe balancing a little bit of the cash flow uh, needs of the town. But at this point in time, I think that we have a, uh, an, abil uh, an ability to really utilize these fees on some of the recovery projects that we're looking at to maybe kind of mend those gaps. Um, and then one thing is as you collect fees, there is a kind of a, a, an idea that you're going to spend them on what you're collecting them for. So I think it's important that we update the project list, which we'll hopefully bring forward to the council and then start looking at uh, items to where we can actually spend these fees. So they are, these are designated um, monies that we collect. They're designated for the impact of, of whatever you're whatever the on. roads, the yeah. drainage, whatever. Exactly. So how does this interface with what Mark talked about earlier with our road recovery and all that stuff that's going to be happening? How does that tie in? I think that we can identify projects through that to earmark for these these fees to be spent on those on those projects. So if there is a project that's identified through that uh, transportation plan, I think we can then take those projects, identify which ones will fit these these fees and then have it available to spend. Or if there's a shortfall on one of them where yep. they don't cover some part of it, we have those fees we can tap into to finish that project. I believe so. Yep. Can I, like on Pence Road, like if we were going to fix the road with some of the money, like the drainage fees, like all those ditches, we could, you know, we could put in pipe and cover those over with the drainage fee money. We well, if, unless, like that. that's what I'm saying, we have these other fee, these other monies coming in. This would be might, kind of your, yeah, your gap funding. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and how about for uh, where, where we have to have matching funds for some grants, can that be used? I, I believe it can just as long as it's being spent as as on on the project again we're gonna have to update that list so that it's transparent on what these funds are going to be spent on um, but I do believe that those have opportunities as long as it's it meets the criteria of those what those funds are I believe it can be spent on those it doesn't have to be a hundred percent by those funds right Kevin, I don't know if I can interject or if you can hear me but I, uh, I thought I would just chime in this is Mark Maddox um, just wanted to say, as long as the nexus between the development and what created the necessity for a fee uh, to mitigate that impact of that development is there, as long as that nexus is there, for example, like Woody was saying about uh, drainage being undergrounded, we can make a case for uh, the new runoff generated or a need for a, a larger pipe and capacity to include and kind of leverage towards some of these projects or more traffic necessitating a signal at a certain intersection generated by prior development of the town. If that nexus is there, we can leverage as best as we can. Uh, we can't um, just go creating new projects to be solely funded through these um, that aren't development, you know, related uh, as far as the origin of, of that fee being collected. Um, so there is some rules to go, go through, but um, it's, it's certainly an opportunity uh, that we have to, to make the best out of these projects as we can and make them all work together. Just a, Thank you. Just a quick point of clarification for anyone that may be listening. These are not new fees that we are assessing. These are fees that we have already collected. That is correct. Thank you. And will they be increased or reduced going forward? I don't have an answer for you on that one. Okay. So this is mostly just reporting our annual report. Yep. Okay. Can I make a motion or do we have any any cards? I have no cards or receive no comments on this. I'll item. move acceptance of this report. I'll second. Motion by Boland, seconded by Jones. Roll call vote. Councilmember Boland. Aye. Councilmember Colleton. Aye. Vice Mayor Jones. Aye. Councilmember Tryon. Aye. And Mayor Crowder. Aye. <laughs> item six E is uh Katie, uh, consider adopting resolution number 21-03, a resolution of the Town Council of the Town of Paradise approving an allocation of funding and the execution of a grant agreement. 
Yes, <clears throat> good evening again. So this is a mastered standard agreement between the Town of Paradise and HCD for the allocation of $55 million for multifamily housing projects in the town from CDBG DR. So the, the MSA that you have before you tonight is just the first step in a pretty extensive due diligence process where we're setting ourselves up to receive these funds and then to be, be able to allocate them out to developers. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions. It's a pretty basic agreement. The majority of the language did come from HCD. We are familiar with the master standard agreement because we do operate housing programs. Um, so this is just an opportunity for us to make sure that we do secure those multifamily housing funds. How, so, how soon will, is this money going to be available? Like, and, and like where... Where will people go to find? Because I've had a few people that have seen this and asked about it. So. so we are meeting with HCD Weekly, which is excellent. They have a lot of investment in the town's success on owner owner occupied owner occupied housing funds, multifamily funds and funds and infrastructure. So we are um, waiting for the policies and procedures for the 2018 DR funds to be available, and then we will know when the funds will roll out to the public. So the multifamily funds will flow through the town. The owner-occupied funds will flow directly through HCD. So if you have someone, a property owner, for example, who says, I would like to apply for H CDBG DR funds for owner-occupied housing, you know, they would apply directly to HCD. Yeah, no, no, this is for, I know people in town that have property, and you know that want to build duplexes sure. and things and so, they saw this and they're yep. they're asking so that's why i was just wondering when yep. where where do we direct them to to kate so to right you, right to now yes i would say right now we're sort of having pre-development meetings with um, companies that are interested in building multifamily housing in paradise so we just had one this week and what we're doing is we're talking with them about um, you know, we're talking with them about kind of all the programs that are available, but letting them know a little bit about CDBG DR in terms of what we can release to the public. But the marketing has not been released by HCD yet. They're still getting that lined up. So I would say if someone's interested, have them contact me or okay. Kate or Kevin, and we're having these pre-development meetings. Because it's, I guess you just brought up another concern. I mean, we have a lot of people in town, you know, that did own apartments and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I know I talked to a young couple today that, that, and when they heard about this, they said, yeah, what do I have to do? Who do I talk to? I mean, it, it would be interesting to me that we're having meetings with developers, uh, you know. I mean, we would certainly want to let people in town that are developers Oh, definitely. No, before I, I, we let bring in yeah. a lot of outside people. Yeah, no, I definitely want to 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 let you know that we're we are not soliciting these conversations. These are just developers who are doing other multifamily projects, either in Paradise or Chico or Reading, who just have interest in speaking with us. But I would okay. say, um, you know, the CDBG DR multifamily housing funds, once they become available, we will be doing a very significant. Uh, regional marketing push because, of course, the county is okay. receiving their allocation, the city of Chico is receiving an allocation. So this MSA that we're looking at tonight is just asking yeah. the town council to execute an agreement right. so that we can begin so the due diligence get, No, process. I understand what this yeah. is for, but I was just like say because some people saw the agenda and saw and read it, you yeah. know, uh, a, a couple of people have approached me and said, how do I find out more about yep, it? Not you out know? yet. Yep. So, but I should direct those people to contact you. Sure, if someone wants to talk about multifamily housing in the okay. town, we definitely are, we, we've been having those conversations sort of ongoing. And just to be clear, we're not having CDBG DR specific conversations. We're not soliciting development conversations yet. So what will probably be coming to town council next after this MSA is executed is an opportunity potentially to work with a consultant to do some of the project solicitation and early vetting so that we can send those prioritized and sort of approved projects from the town to the state. So we, we are fairly, Busy here, I'm sure you've heard Kate Anderson say with our Cal Home grant. So what we would probably do is is hire the consultant for the multifamily housing. So that will be the next step in terms of what we bring to council. But tonight is just getting the due diligence okay. process started. So there will be a, a some type of um. You'll you'll find a way to let people know. If oh, absolutely. Okay, got Same it. with owner occupied funding. There will be a really big push, and what we're looking at specifically for these types of funds is making sure we're connecting with the groups that have direct 
um, contact already with survivors like the DCMs and even mm -hmm. those in, with temporary use permits in town. We have this dedicated list of folks who are living in RVs who could, who CDBG DR owner occupied funds could bridge that gap for them in terms of rebuilding. So we are definitely strategizing all of that. Um, it's really too soon on the development side to start to yeah. start working with developers, but in terms of helping them understand the landscape in Paradise and also how the sewer service area is going to change multifamily development in Chico, or I'm sorry, in Paradise, we're definitely having those conversations now. Okay, because this is, you know, the the, the owner occupied one. There's criteria for that. Sure. So you, you got to had been lived here before. This is for anybody who can come into town, buy a plot, a bunch of lots, and they could start throwing right. up. This is for and they can get this grant housing. money, mm -hmm. you know, and it's $55 million. I certainly want local developers and local builders or whatever to know about this and have first shot before we get everybody out of San Jose and Yeah, Sacramento we'll, we'll definitely be doing a lot of okay. marketing. So we just don't have that information yeah, yet. We okay. haven't completed the due diligence, so it would be really premature to go into all of that. But what we do know is there's a $55 million allocation to the town, and we want to go ahead and um, process or get, you know, complete the due diligence process right, right. so get that we money. can get, we can receive the funds and we can start making that available to developers. Cool. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions for Katie? I make, I make a motion that we accept 21. Dash no, three. no cards, Dina. I've no, no. I've received no comments on this item. I'll second. All right. Council member motion by Council member Tryon, seconded by Council Vice Mayor Jones. Roll call vote. Council member Bolin. Aye. Council member Culleton. Aye. Vice Mayor Jones. Aye. Council member Tryon. Aye. And Mayor Crowder. Aye. Motion okay. passes. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thanks, Katie. Okay. Number seven, seven A, council initiated agenda items. And seven A one is discuss providing free burn permits to town of Paradise residents and consider changing the burn permit period from a calendar year to a fisc fiscal year. And this is Councilman Culleton. Okay, so I brought this up because um, one of the things that I'm experiencing in town, and I've been here since the 10th of, uh, November 2018 every day is uh, um, a lot of people are just you know th th we've been beat up and wore out and, and we're traumatized and I know all of us up here pretty much are too but uh, so I just wanted to do something for the town now and, and, but I've had some thoughts about this you know yeah if you buy a burn permit in January 1st which is the current process it's good until December 31st and so Theoretically, you know, you get to operate in both burn periods if we have a winter burn period. Normally we get two weeks or used to be longer, but we get like two weeks in the spring to do burning, to clean up our lots. Um, but my point is like right now, like it's perfect weather for people to burn slash and, and weeds and things and, and help with the cleanup we're doing in our town. Uh, my permit ended the 31st of December. I have to go pay another $25 to uh, to do that. So my idea of a free burn permit for people and changing the, the date, I still would like to change the date to make it uh, um, the same as our fiscal year from July 1 through June 30th. That way, uh, when you have an extended winter period and you're able to burn further in the winter, you've already bought your permit and you're good to go. Um, the idea of free was just to like kind of just throw a bone to our, our citizens, say, hey, look, at, you know what? Um, here, we're going to give you a relief for a year. But what I would suggest in, in thinking about this, because I thought, well, I'm really asking for something that's really kind of stupid, I guess. I don't know. But um, I thought, well, if if we can, and I don't know what's involved with legally, but if we can just change it to where the time period is from uh, July 1st through June 30, 30th or 31st, our, uh, same as our fiscal year, if we could do that so that it works better for burning, um, and then take anybody with an act with a burn permit from 2020 and just ex extend it. You know, in other words, that's kind of giving them the freebie. Like if we can, at the next meeting or something, make the change. I, I don't know if we have to, what's involved in making that change. And then just say, okay, we're extending your permit. Say now or, this is your new expiration date and you don't have to come and pay anything, you know, right now. And you get to burn for the next 
month or two while we have rain. So that would be my suggestion. I don't know if it's possible. I just think it makes more sense. Uh, there's some fellows down off of Bennett have a big piece of property. Hundreds of trees taken out. Dug all the stumps. You know, they're burning today. They have burn permits. And on the bigger burns, you got to pay a little bit more to do that. And But still, whether it's a $25 one or a $50 one, I just think it would make sense. I would like to see us, you know, to kind of help our citizens and, and make this change so that the burn permit's good through the entire burn period. And uh, and if we can do that, then maybe just say, okay, all existing burn permits that expired on the 30, 31st of December are extended to the 30th, 30th of June and, and, you know, with no additional fees. And if somebody's already paid 25 bucks January 1st, um, we'll give them their money back. I'll give them their money back. I don't, you know, I just, I want to help the, I want to let the citizens know, you know what, yeah, we have compassion, we have a heart, we understand, we want to help. It's maybe a small thing, but it's a way to help. And so I, that, that's my suggestion. And, and I, I, I don't know if I'm saying the same thing as you. Uh, I, I would be in favor of making it good for a year. And uh, I would say I would like to see it made $25 for the entire year, not essentially what it is now. It's $50 a year. No, it's, it's 25 if you just want to burn your leaves, your you know, weeds and stuff. If you want to do a bigger burn, which is different time period, it's 50 But But what I, so you're, oh, buying, oh. you're buying it in September, October, and it's good until December. Then you're buying another one in, in January 1st, that's good. It's good till December 3rd. But normally, we don't normally, it used to be we had a longer burn season, but anymore it's been in, uh, in uh, spring, we get a couple of weeks where we can burn. And then, uh, and then in winter, if we get a winter, if it's wet enough, we're allowed to burn again in the fall. And like right now, it, we got enough wet to where we, it was delayed. And then we finally got it able to burn in the fall, and now we're being able to burn a little longer. So that's why it was to make it like so. Once you buy it, like in July first, like if you know, it would be good for both burn seasons if we have to, and for whatever period of time that the fire department said we could burn, your permit would be good. Like right now, um, you know, I got a little burn pile on a lot I bought next door to me. I haven't lit it yet because my permit expired two weeks ago. You know. And it's not I have enough a weeds question. to pay 25 bucks. Um, so people pay 25 or $50 for these permits. Um, what does the money go to pay for? And it, it, how much do we normally collect? So last year we collected uh, $13,911. This year uh, up to current we've collected $3,000. That 13000 from prior years is abnormally high. We're normally closer to the three to five thousand dollars. It does go into the fire department and does pay for for the fire department. It's not earmarked for specific kind of things. It's just kind of lumped into the fire department budget as a revenue source. I ask this because I do know that there are costs associated with these burn permits, and in in um, on occasion, the fire department does have to go out because people violate the terms of their permits and their neighbors call and want somebody to come make it safe. Um, so I'm not really in favor of making this free, but I don't have any problem changing the fis it to a fiscal year um, from a calendar year. That's fine. And, and still making it $25 for the calendar year? Well, it was $25 for a calendar year, and it'll be $25 for a fiscal year. So monetarily, it doesn't make any difference unless you extend people's burn permits that expired to, um, to June, and then you're not going to have any revenue for six months. But you don't, you know what, I, you know, the fire chief's on the, on, the phone, on the video here. He can speak to this. When you go get a burn permit, you fill out a one-page form at the fire station when it's open, and you give it to them, and you give them your check, and that's it. And they're going to come out on anybody that calls in on an illegal burn 
or pile or any of that stuff or a burn pile going on after hours, they're going to come out and respond to that because we pay our tax dollars to have a fire department so they can respond to that. And so, you know, I mean, I don't know, 25 bucks to get a little piece of paper that's not even this big, it's only that big. You know, Chief, uh, maybe you could tell us if extending like people's treatment. permits that expired December 31st, if we ex extend them for six months and you don't get that revenue, is does that create a hardship for the fire department? Well, there, there'd be some adjustments. And first of all, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. There I am. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, there would be need to be some adjustments into the budget right now as, as it lies with the city so um in line with uh what you're saying uh, council member jones and and to kind of bring this in perspective with everyone and, and maybe bring some light on you have a total of four different burn permits in the in the town process and specifically when we talk about residential burn permits that's for parcels that contain one or two uh family residents uh it's a uh specific pie uh pile size of six feet in diameter and only one pile um so we are in the the time now of uh we want to encourage folks to increase their dispensable space to keep up on it and give them a avenue to do that if they feel comfortable and safe in doing so and give them the tools and knowledge to to, to perform burning i think that is where everyone would agree upon we want to get to so with that i think um besides the the argument of the fee or not the fee i think there's some other recommendations uh, that I'm willing to share with you tonight on the residential burn permit, if you would like to hear them. Absolutely. Yes. Go. Yes. Okay. So I do agree with a yearly permit. Uh, when we look outside of the town of Paradise and into the county and to the uh, SRA of Cal Fire, there is no burn permit required until May 1st. So uh, burn permits are acquired online, both on the county side and in the town of Paradise now. So it's done done completely online. You don't need to visit the fire station anymore. So we've made that a little easier. Uh, so with that, having a required permit for the entire burn season, um, I would agree that it would make it easier on the citizens to go with a fiscal year uh, model because it goes to the entire winter burn period that can be determined by the fire chief with our current ordinance. For last uh, winter and this winter, we have opened burning roughly at the end of November and canceled it uh, by the end of uh, May as we get into uh, fire season. So it seems to be working well. This last year, we've had 110 calls out to uh, smoke checks or check a control burn that uh, did not provide violation of the permit or the attendees. It was just concerned citizens calling the fire department responded. Um, recommendation also to when we look at the the fuel reduction and the land clearing burn permits for the town, you're allowed to burn those piles which are larger till dusk. The residential burn permit only allows you to burn till 2 p.m. I would recommend extending that till dusk, uh, current start time of nine o'clock and in and, and line with the other permits. Uh, I do know that there are concerns out there with uh, hookup to water source because the permit requires that you have a water hose. Um, our other permits at the town, we allow a water hose or another approved fire extinguishing equipment that can readily put out the fire. And we can identify some resources that they should have in order to contain their fire if it was to escape. And the last item I have uh, to talk about would be the removal of the ordinance of the east and west until we see a increase in uh, residents in the town where we feel that that would need to be reinstituted. That sounds good to me. Comments I have. So, are you recommending us to make it a free, or do you feel like that'd be a hardship on the fire department? I think with the current budget of the fire department, that it would be a hardship if you if you remove that that money in there. Okay. What about? So, I'm not I'm not suggesting remove it forever. Like if we can change the the uh, permit time to the fiscal year. So like I bought a permit that expired December 31st. I paid that $25. Uh, just anybody that has an active burn permit, they won't have to renew it until June 31st or July 1st if we were to go ahead and make, would that create a hardship also? I mean, that's a no, low I think, revenue. I think we could live with the grace, grace period until that time frame. Cool. That's what I was asking for. Yeah, I wasn't meaning forever, just a one-time okay. deal. So our question is, do we want to bring this to a future 
council, right? If that's what it takes, what does it take, Chief, to, to make this change? Is this an ordinance or is it what? It, it, it is an ordinance uh, change as well as some verbiage on the permit, both. Uh, so I can bring back so, you know, officially those those items next council meeting. Is, is that okay? Yeah, I'd like to see those brought well, back like with his suggestions. Great. Yeah. Everything that you talked about. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's all I wanted to bring to the council for. I think that I, I really appreciate uh, what you shared with us about how it's going to make our community safer. It's going to help our citizens. It's going to make it easier for you guys. Uh, and I appreciate all that you guys do. So uh, thanks a lot for that. And hopefully you can bring that back next council. So all council concurs to bring this back to the February meeting, correct? I do. Yes. yes. Okay. Do we need a vote or? No. Council I'll concur. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Chief. Chief. Thank you. You look good, by the way. <laughs> oh, item 7A2, just option regarding a space patrol consider bringing back and extending the ordinance to allow green waste processing for both private and state projects for paradise. Ryan. You want to go? Absolutely, <laughs> if that's okay. Good evening, Council. I'm Susan Hartman, the Community Development Director. And I just wanted to do a short overview where we're at with the town's green waste yard before we start any conversation about other facilities or anything about green waste. So the current situation for the town's yard, which is located at the corner of American and American Way and Clark Road, which is operated by NRWS through our franchise agreement, has been closed since the fire. Because of the reduction in service accounts, which help fund this yard, as well as the reduced staffing from NRWS and the stormwater upgrades necessary to this facility, it's just been financially infeasible up to this point to operate the yard. So currently, the alternative options that property owners have would be the Nil Road Recycling and Waste Facility, the Old Durham Wood Facility, or the Oroville Solid Waste Transfer Station. So different options that we've explored since the fire. One was to file a claim with our insurance, but it wasn't approved. Another was to work with NRWS to figure out what the monthly cost would be to operate it at either three days a week or five days a week. And that was between 40 and $45,000 a month. At that time in 2019, the town did not have the finances to put aside to open up the yard at that cost. We also worked with Cal Fire about the air curtain burners. So to be the most efficient, they should run 24 seven. They take about four to six hours to warm up. And so between the staffing cost, the temporary exemption we had to get just to run a burner at an elevation below 1500 feet, as well as the additional licensing the town would need through the state because we're just a chip and grind. It just was not financially feasible at that point to do it. So other options, there could be other new or privately owned green waste yards that can open in town. The industrial services zone potentially allows those kind of operations. It needs a use permit from the planning commission. It does require environmental review and it's through a public hearing process. They would also be subject to licensing both through Butte County and through air quality management district. But that's another option also for private enterprise. And so that's just kind of bring you up to speed to where we're at right now. And I'd be glad to get any feedback or comments from the council. Susan, do you know yes. how many rate payers NRWS would need to actually operate the facility again? So the green waste yard was subsidized through the commercial accounts, not the residential and the gate fee. So it's a, mainly the commercial corridor that we would need back, plus just the users then on the resident, well, combination of residential and commercial like landscape mm -hmm. to bring there. It was a combo of the two. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Do we have any idea of, like, say if we had um, a yard, say we used American Way or not, <laughs> um, what would it cost to have, um, say, Old Durham Wood come up with a grinder and grind for us? That's Just as a stop gap until we can... Well, the forty to 45000 would be if we used NRWS to do that, and they work with Old Durham Wood mm -hmm. for that. I don't have a cost for you if the town were somehow to hire additional direct staff to run it, and we didn't price out directly only because that's already part of that franchise agreement, so we'd have to take a look at the franchise agreement and renegotiate those terms, also the billing rates, and then put that out as potentially an RFP if we want other agencies involved in the operation of that yard. Okay. So I don't have a direct price for Old Durham Wood between us and them. So I, I think that would be interesting just to see what they would charge us. Like, again, just trying to, here, here's, here's mm -hmm. my concern where this is where I'm going with this. <laughs> we have a requirement of our citizens to keep their lots clear, but they really, in many ways, have difficulty getting rid of their green waste. I understand that they have Neal Road, they have Old Durham Wood, but that's a long ways for some of our residents to go to. So what I'm looking for is some type of facility here that they can take their waste to, and then also the possibility of, of maybe using um, chips or something on their yards in return to mitigate their weed control. And so I guess that's, that's why I'm bringing this forward is to try to find some way to help our residents. Um, we, we've talked about this for years, and we had it with our NRWS when, when we had the population up here, and we've talked about it since the fire, and it's very, it's very difficult. It's very expensive. We don't have the money just to, to, to throw to this. Um, I, you know, I, I totally agree 100%. I talk to landscapers, and they go, where do we do? Where do we go? Right. <clears throat> because um, they're now increasing not... their costs to our residents because they have to take their way so far. Well, true. Neil true. Road isn't really they that don't have far. It's, it's like some people. It's 10 minutes. It's not, it's not that many no, miles. That's, that's, that's not even true. That's, you know what, the, the whole thing about Neil Road landfill, the, the, the Cal Recycle, years ago, we were supposed to do 50% diversion. We're supposed to divert 50%, you're not supposed to take any green waste to the landfill. And what the landfill was doing was hiring Randy McLaughlin and Old Durham Wood to bring his grinder up there, and then there's another guy he hires to bring up there. And that $40,000 was the, the NRWS gave you. And NRWS, the, when we had waste management before them. We had three or four things. They ran the, our green, we owned the dirt. They ran our green waste yard, and there was no contract or anything. And the tipping fee at the gate and stuff. So, I mean, this idea that, oh, oh you can take, I mean, Neil Road landfill is not a thing, and there's a lot of people, like seniors, like myself, that may not have trucks or trailers or income. You know, we're living on Social Security. I can't hire some landscaper or somebody with a dump trailer to haul my stuff off, you know, and somebody younger than me to go gather it up. So, I mean, the fact, when we went to recycling in this town and had a franchise and got rid of three or four waste haulers, part of the franchise is that they must take the green waste and the recyclables. Well, the recycling market's gone to heck. Neil Road Landfill is illegally taking green waste there, you know, and it's being dumped in the landfill too. You know, now recently they've been source separating it so that they can have somebody take it off, so that they're not breaking the law, but they're breaking their own laws. You know, it's just, you know, I, we have an obligation to provide something for the citizens. One of the problems you had that why the why Northern's uh, cost was so high was because the water quality, regional water quality control board comes in there because it's an industrial site and they test that water there all the time and there's high iron in the dirt in the absolute, so they were requiring a lot of upgrades that had to be made so you don't have any liquid runoff from your green waste facility. That's one of the reasons it was plugged in there. So. I mean, I, you know, I, we need to open a green waste yard somehow, some way. So I'm um, trying I, to interpret what you just said. Are you saying that they, Northern Recycling was not spending that much money? Or that's, those aren't true costs? Or I, no, I don't no, understand no, what no, you're saying. No, no. 
No, that cost included. Hang on one second. Um, Mark Maddox has um, uh, something to add. Okay. Yeah, I, I think at this point it'd be good just to note, um, starting in 2012 and the annual report submitted by NRWS and working with uh, prior town staff, we can speak to exactly what Council Member Culleton is saying is that the site itself is underdeveloped for the operation that has been uh, being taken place for years. And the State Water Board's been watching it. Some environmental groups have been watching it. Uh, we really do need an industrial permit. And in order to get that permit, some infrastructure improvements on the site to, uh, to process uh, and perform these operations need to be made. And that can be at the tipping pad, uh, drainage improvements in post-construction standards and retention ponds. Um, prior in 2012, it was estimated at 400,000. Uh, working with NRWS staff just months ago, uh, 750,000 was kind of brought up as what the town would need to invest in the site to have a permittable operation to process green waste for a permanent use or at least a long-term use uh, moving forward if that were to reopen up. And that's some of the apprehension in the franchisee and NRWS and, and why they weren't able to keep going um, and something to keep an eye on if we were to open it up that, that perhaps that infra infrastructure would need to be uh, put in place before we could open the doors. So you're saying 750,000 is the number that came up, plus we'd have the 40 to 45,000 a month to right. run it. Right. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. Okay, so now, one so of the things I, that, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. One of the things I was advocating for before I got back on the council was why we didn't, because of the fire and because of our unique position, why we didn't as a town go and leverage the Water Quality Control Board and say, you know what, give us an, a buy, give us an exemption, give us a five year, 10 year exemption, you know, like, because there's nothing to get hurt down there. I mean, they got an old burn dump right below there that's been buried for years that nobody wants to talk about because if the feds find out about it, they're gonna, they're gonna make a, the county clean it up, you know? So, I mean, but we didn't go do that. We didn't go fight for ourselves to say, look, we really need this facility. So let us have a buy on that. We might not have won, but we needed to fight the fight. So that's- We didn't have the money to run it. You didn't, anyway. it does, it, you don't know that. I mean, you got a lot of money to run a lot of other things. So, you know, you, you still have an obligation. You still, we, we are here, the Town of Paradise government is here to serve the citizens of this community. And if we're gonna make rules and give them all a bunch of tickets because they didn't clean up their weeds, but we say, oh, yeah, but have to drive them down the hill. I'm sorry, there's something wrong with that. So there is a, another potential option okay. is we at one point had um, an urgency ordinance to, for, process, for yards um, in the, mm -hmm. the tree removal process. Um, we could allow processing on those yards. And I think that there's an individual who may come and give us a presentation um, that he could use his yard for the processing of the trees because he's part of the tree removal. Mm -hmm. And he would also consider doing a green waste facility while he's operating that yard. So that is a possibility. The urgency ordinance expired, correct? It did. Correct. So, and also to keep in mind, a uh, great idea is that if we did use that same language and add it in the hazard tree urgency ordinance, is to keep in mind that the vegetative waste part, not the log processing, but the vegetation, it's supposed to be logs and vegetation that are burned damaged associated with the campfire. And those facilities were exempted from environmental review under a very specific CEQA ordinance that talks about mitigating um, eminent threats to the public. And that's what we've declared the trees. That's why that works. So maybe as, you know, a so side new, kind of- New weeds that have grown since then wouldn't qualify. Not for the ongoing maintenance of properties. No, it's specific that long-term projects don't qualify under that exemption. But if you were clearing your yard mm -hmm. and you had some brush that went with it, other vegetation, there may be an argument to be made that it's all part of that eminent threat cleanup. But I just wanted to bring that to your attention. That exemption for environmental was very specific about log processing. But well, we're talking about can, two different things. Can I just things. say we're how brilliant you are? <laughs> yeah, and how long, how long, Susan, yes, would sir. that, 
If you could do that. If we transfer that into the hazard tree ordinance? How, how long could that last for under the emergency ordinance where we would not have to, where we would be exempt from we, CEQA? Well, we still have a declared state of emergency in the town, and that's part of the issue, too, for the time frame that that exists, that we're doing actual jobs that are mitigating these eminent threats. Those are all arguments that can be made. I just want to make sure that the primary use continues to be log storage and processing and that any kind of vegetative stuff was just incidental. Right, right, right. So it, so it seems really like we're talking about problem. two different things. We're talking about logs and we're talking yeah, about green waste. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah, think we need to keep those separate. Yeah, no, there are two different things. And so that could be a problem with that. Because like Gary Warner up in Megalia, mm -hmm. his yard up there, he's taking green waste in there. You can haul it there. You don't have to go to Neil mm -hmm. Road. So, you know, but you're, a lot of people like if, if you're cleaning your lot up, I mean, my house is cleaned up. So anything that I would generate there would be green waste. So it wouldn't qualify if we were to do the emergency thing for that. But if I had a dead tree on a lot that I bought or I was developing, then all of that stuff could be. Right, and it's the idea that it would just be a temporary use. It would eventually time out just like the ordinance would. So it's not a permanent solution. And I know that's what we're kind of talking about is citing these green yards. It could potentially be this accessory activity that's operating in conjunction with this hazard mitigation project that we're doing because that burned vegetation is part of it also, right. but it's not the main thing. So I have a question about yes, um, extending the urgency ordinance for the logs and oh. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, we issued temporary use permits, I believe, on three parcels. You're correct. And none of them actually worked. One got up and running for a while, right. but then he couldn't find a place to actually take the stuff and ended up having to close. And the other two never got up and running, correct? Correct. Has anything changed that would change that? I mean, it, it seemed like it didn't work. You're right. They were limited to private program only. I can't say for sure that maybe the gentleman that had the permit for the two yards that never opened, you know, if it was open to both public and private mm -hmm. programs, that there wouldn't be more traction. I don't know. Yeah. But previously, it was just for private, and that's how we noticed it. So those permits that we issued, we can't extend them. This would be an potentially be an item where we'd add that same language, but in the hazard tree ordinance where it doesn't currently exist, but they'd have to go through that process again because we told the neighborhood it was going to be private program only and that all operations would cease by December 31st, 2020. And we have to honor well, that. It's, well, it's likely to be private program only anyway because the state's already issued all of its contracts and those contracts require its subs to haul it all off. Mm -hmm. So it's very unlikely that the state would use these facilities anyway. Mm -hmm. So economically, they're going to be restricted to the FEMA, private program. FEMA would have to redo their contracts with their contract. That could be very true. Who would? Pardon? FEMA would have to redo their contract with That's their contract. That's not going to happen. Why would they have to do that? Because they're all written up with the... We're talking about logs now. I thought we were talking about green waste. Well, but we're, we're talking about logs now. No, but they're, they're having to take. We're, we're taking them off the hill. Problems. That's part of the contract the, that they have, and that's part of the of agreement. The logs, but the the slash and everything else, it, it just says it has to be cleaned up from the properties. Well, that's being that's being ground up on site. That's not an issue. It's the logs. Like no, that. it's not. It is. Well, yes, it no, is. That's what we just that talked about. The, the grappler house. trucks are being loaded up and hauled to Old Durham Woods. That's the logs. Yes. That's the logs. No, the grap. No, it's not. It's the slash. Some of the slash is being ground on site, but a lot of it, the bigger stuff, is being... It's, I mean, up, to, it's I mean, up to their decision. They, they can do it on site or they can do it And if we there. allow them to do it at these yards that we've established they can park their trucks in, then we're, keep, we're, we're reducing the impact to our roads. We said all them trucks going downhill to Old Durham Wood because that's where they're going. They're going there or Oroville to be processed. All of the, the logs are going to Oroville and the slash are going to Old Durham Wood. Well, but Greg I, is correct. They would have to redo their contracts, and they're, they've already said that they're probably not going to do that. And ten, and 10 months we waited mm -hmm. for these contracts to get figured out, and these contractors get online, and they're finally going. Is, to change that now is... Have you seen the contract? We're I not asking the them to change well, contracts. Yeah. Let, let, let Rose, Pardon? Let, let Rose... I didn't hear I, We're not asking them to change contracts. The limitations on the yards were placed there by the town of Paradise. 
So Cal OES and the meetings that we had and the, the partners that were there at the time would not oppose having processing on these yards. The reason that some of these yards did not go forward is because after they went through their review process, they were told, okay, you can't use them for these yard logs. You can only use them for these yards. Whether there was some type of a misunderstanding on whose part, I don't really know. But I think what we're trying to do at this point is kind of clear that up so that we can, you know, have a place for our residents. Plus, they can do the processing that they need to do on these yards that they were not able to do prior. Okay, you made a lot of assumptions there that okay. the town made those decisions. That was that was the state and FEMA. That it was, was there not, a part of that. But, it was um, it was not. Sorry. Well, I, were you there? No. Okay. But we have now confirmed that it was the town. Sorry. Okay, maybe I wasn't there. I don't I know. know. I was. I, I was not there at that time either. I, I've I, heard both sides of it, so I don't know what's true. Yeah. But 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 here's here's my two cents. It doesn't matter at this point. I mean, it's, it is it's our it town. Is. It's now, our town. Now let so, me to also to, to be, be fair. To, like to be fair, uh, Friday uh, on this this um, ride along, I I asked Cole about if the town would allow it. Would they process the wood? Would a processing yard work in paradise? And his response and uh, Tom's response, which who's in charge of that, said, as far as paradise goes, they would not be interested in utilizing it because the situation they have using old Durham wood is, is working and they're not interested. He did go on to say, now, they're doing also free work in Megalia and above. He said, could that make sense? Possibly. But I can't give you an answer on that unless I could find out how much it would charge, it would cost us to process it in Paradise. How much would it save on, on going to old Durham Wood? And they... They will not give a commitment on that until they, they get pricing. As far as the uh, processing in Paradise for Paradise trees, he said there, it would not save any wear and tear on our road because they're, they're leaving with full trucks. Woody, I'm just telling you word for word what Cole said and Rose, is that not what he said about Paradise? That is what he said about the trees that are in Paradise. However, I think it's important to point out that there's two separate contracts. So there's and, a contract. And I'm not, I'm not talking about beyond. I'm talking within the town of Paradise right now. Okay. But there's an impact for mm -hmm. both contracts on the, on the town of Paradise. So you have a contract that is the trees that are within the town of Paradise and you have a contract for the trees that are in the surrounding areas that are not within the town limits. There's two separate contractors with separate subs that are on both of those contracts, which is probably part of the complication for the whole thing to begin with. But um, so both of those, not only the trees inside of the town limits, but the trees outside of the town limits are also impacting our roads now how that be, because you're going to now wait a minute Woody, uh, just that that you're you're going to leave wh whether you have a yard in paradise for those trees or not you're still going to leave county property come into paradise drop those logs go back i mean you, you're still coming through whether they're they're stopping in paradise or driving through to old durham wood or wherever you're still making that trek, correct? You are. And it seems to me that you would actually, if you're talking about processing trees from outside of the town, I'm not interested in that at all. Because you'd have 
additional impacts on the residents in Paradise. When I saw this on the agenda, I started asking people in town how they felt about changing the situation so that the state, who is now hauling all this stuff out of town, would be processing it in town. Every single person I asked said they were opposed to it because they don't want the impacts of the noise and the dust and what comes from that kind of operation. Now, maybe they could put up with it to process our trees, but why should they put up with it to process trees outside of our town? Okay, so let me... I think what me, might be a good idea is to have us listen to the gentleman who is interested in doing this. And so that way, he has the statistics. And Kevin, I don't know if you've talked to him recently and if he's still interested or not. Um, I think he may be able to explain it a lot better. And he has the facts. So to answer your point, um, if the trees that they, I'm just going to give you an example. If the trees that they are uh, taking are in Megalia, they are coming through our town regardless of which way we do it. So, but I do understand if they're coming but from they're, south of town, that's completely a different conversation. Well, they're not stopping here, though. They're just I know. leaving. Uh, but I'm just saying, let's take a look at it. And if this is something that we could also use as a green waste yard for our... Um, and and I, think, I think also we need to take a look at what does processing mean in this particular situation, because I think that different people have different views of what that's going to look like. And then... Um, if this is also something that could be a green waste yard for our residents, you know, I think it, it would be advisable to at least hear them out. Who's and this gentleman? A, uh, Ron, I don't know if there's more than one, but there was a gentleman by the name of Ron Sandman. Okay. It's M. Shire in it. LLC. He's the one who got the... I know he is. Okay. Yeah. He got the two permits. Yeah, Lower Clark, didn't... Upper Skyway. Why did he not do anything with those permits that he got? It's my understanding, and I know that Kevin has talked to him too, that he got the permits, and then after he got the permits, he was told that he could not do state any trees. of the state trees. Right. But that was in the ordinance. It said that from the very He knew beginning. that when he went in. He knew that when he went in. <laughs> so let me, to your point, Steve, the grappler trucks, if there's 10 crews that, that what's the name said we have in town, maybe we'll have 50. So each crew is going to come by. The grappler truck that took down 14 trees across the street from my house has been there four times, loaded up. Now, they had a different truck took the logs, and the logs went someplace. But the grappler truck came and took the slash. Each one of those trucks is like a fire engine that drives up and down my street. is the equivalent of three cars or four cars. So now you've got 10 grappler trucks on each job site driving all the way through down, down to wherever they got to go, you know, that's an impact to our roads. Which they Whereas still if do. they grind the, tr if they're hauling them just over to the yard somewhere up here, then you're putting them just one big transfer truck that's going all the way to Anderson but to the, to where the stuff is. They would still leave your, your, your street. They would still leave my street. They would still go away to, from that. They'd still go into town somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And but what, you're not going to have them going all the way through town on all the streets. And... Again, what, what Cole said, this, and I don't know yeah. if it was with logs or slash or, or what that left where we were at. It hit three sites, loaded up, and then went down to old Durham Wood. And he, he had said that he did not, again, we're talking paradise trees, not right. out, outside, that there would not be an impact to our truck traffic if they process logs within the town of, of Paradise, nor would they do it. Now, they did say the county, perhaps, they, they, don't, they don't know yet. And, and that contract, I don't, I don't believe it's up to the individual contractors to change that. I believe that would be up to Cal OES. It's the contractors have made the deal. Uh, Ranford, who got the contract from OES, made the deal with Old Durham not, not Cal Recycle, not Cal OES. They hired Banford. Banford made the okay. deal. But, so but that, Cal OES is the issuing, so they, they have... But it, I don't believe, and I haven't seen it, nor has anybody here apparently, that, that the contract that they gave to 
whoever the, the contractors are, told them that they had to take it to Old Durham Wood or to Neil Road. It just simply said they had to remove it, you know. So, I mean, it's all, I don't know, I haven't seen it. Uh, we could find that out. Well, the contract says off. But, but to, to Rose's point, and from what Susan said, there's no way, even if we allowed processing of burnt trees, state, state contract product, uh, we could not commingle green waste. We would have to go do jump through some other. At some point, we might be able to get away with it for a little while, but at some point, we'd have to go. And, and, and to Rose's point, I don't think that it would hurt to listen to her uh, person. I, I'd be interested to at least hear what he had to say. And, and again, we're looking at more than just the state program trees because there are a lot of other trees we still have our back 40 trees that yeah. we haven't done yet either i mean mm -hmm. we, we have this tendency to focus on the state program but there's a lot more in in our town so I, the category four trees or i think they said 10 percent of the trees that would be remaining right when that the okay. percentage yeah. right around 10 percent i think that's so is that is, true, Katie? Is what you're asking for tonight just to bring back the court, category four is ten percent? Explain what he wants to do. So I think it's two things. I think that would be good to to listen to him. But I think also this um, urgency or ordinance has ended, and so we would have to bring it back for them to be able to redo these contracts. Well, until I hear. A proposal that seems like it would actually work to me I'm not prepared to entertain the urgency ordinance again so maybe we start with him because so far I haven't heard anything that I think could actually work oh I have <laughs> yeah I know yeah and, 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 and to me I'm driving around this town all day long I mean I'm up and down this town for six six to eight hours every day. And I just don't see that, that number of trucks that is, it's huge. I mean, when, when we did the debris removal, oh my goodness, <laughs> yeah. I counted 50 trucks between Oroville and Paradise. And I, don't, I just don't see that many trucks. We now we don't. We don't have 50 tree crews. Well, that's yeah. true. And that is true, and that's no, why that's I brought that up. No, I'm glad you did. That's why I said that, because there, is, there, there isn't the crews that they promised to us. But maybe there never will be the crews they promised no, to they us. they won't be. I'm afraid, the I'm afraid that they can't find the crews, and that's why we don't have them. But that wasn't said tonight. I don't know. Rose, are you good with letting him come? Let's hear him out. And at that point, we can talk about what comes next. That yeah, I mean, I think if he wants to come at this point, if he listens to this, he may not. But I mean, yeah, I think that would be good. Everybody, and, and maybe maybe try to find out from Cal Recycle or OES, find out. If there is any stipulation on the contract or where they take stuff, find out and find out whether or not, you know, can we commingle things? I mean, kind of have a plan. Well, there is a stipulation because the town of Paradise put it there. So, no, no, that was on the processing. Okay, got it. Right. I see what you're saying. I mean, it, right. And so that, that's a piece that could be changed. It. Okay, so, <laughs> the end. End use facility for trees removed by contractors in the government program were allowed to be at the discretion of the contractors. Right. right. So, um, and what they did say, as we as we heard at the site visit last Friday, is the current contractors working in the government program in the town would not be interested in processing logs here in town, and it would not create additional efficiencies because of their current operational status of moving from properties to fill up the trucks to then move. So they were not interested in storing logs in town. They feel like that would just sort of be an additional step in the process. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. one of the things that I want to mention too, sorry, that we're, we're talking about is because we're concerned about wear and tear on the roads, and we kind of mentioned this when Cole was talking, is 
Currently, the state contractors are working to remove slash and logs from properties after tree felling within 48 hours. They have up to seven days. So if we do allow them to have up to seven days, then they can go from property to contiguous property, filling up trucks that way versus, as we sort of saw on our site visit, they go from one street to another street to another street to fill up their trucks. So there's a lot of um, efficiencies that we're looking at, not only for time for residents, but for wear and tear on our facilities here in town. So um, the contracts are available on the Cal Recycle website. So those are public information and that link is available um, I could probably make that available to council through Kevin's weekly report as well. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Katie. Thank you both. I appreciate it. We appreciate it. So the direction from council is for the town manager Phillips will reach out to the individual and have him come back to the next council meeting as a presentation. Correct? Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. And everyone is in concurrence with that? Yes. yes. All right. Thank you. So, item 7A2 discuss options. Regarding, uh, okay, we, we did, did that, that one. Sorry, 7B, council reports on committee representation. Uh, there was no LAFCO. They canceled this month, so I don't, I don't have anything. Uh, no, nobody called me up to go to a committee. I, if I missed, I might have missed one. Did I? Which one? Well, I don't know when committees meet. I got a thing that said you're on these committees, but I have no idea when they meet what? or where. Maybe. So, maybe that's on purpose. Huh? It could be on purpose. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Jody, anything? Um, AQMD was canceled this last <coughs> month. I did go to BCAG. There was um, nothing of interest there. I also attended the meeting on AB 36 um, via Zoom with Assemblyman Gallagher, and that's about it. Rose? Um, I was sitting in on BCAG, also as the alternative, um, and listening in and learning. And I will be doing an onboarding with the um, Air Quality Management District tomorrow. That's a fun one. Um, I, I did the tour with Cal uh, OES, oh, yeah, and I did. Uh, as, as did Rose. I was also on the, uh, the sewer call with uh, James Gallagher. Um, and then I had a meeting with Hope Crisis Response Network, uh, which is a group that is here that wants to build uh, homes in paradise and uh, for, for the people that, that can't afford them. Um, they're right now working out of, uh, uh, well, I guess how they're working at CMA church and, uh, are looking to set up at the hospice house, uh, to house their workers. And, uh, they've got some partnerships they're working on and, uh, they're figuring that they could build if these partnerships come through maybe 50 houses uh, a year, and uh, uh, they, they've got the money to build these homes, and, and they figure that they can do a three-bedroom, two-bath home for about $110,000, and uh, I think it'd be a real asset to, uh, to the community. So they're, they're trying to uh, work out details and what have you, and as we hear more, we'll, we'll bring that back. So... That include doors and windows. That's and appliances. <laughs> cool. I'll buy two. Uh, so seven C future agenda items. No, I don't have any. <laughs> no, I don't have anything. Jody. No, I don't. Rose. Back. Okay. So eight. Staff communication, town manager report. <laughs> 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 
Good evening again, Council. I just wanted to give you a brief update about the activities and community development. So last month at the Planning Commission meeting, they approved a use permit for a new outdoor automotive sales yard on Upper Clark 6627, and that's for a local builder, Ken Blanton. It's kind of across from where Kmart is. Um, we're not having a Planning Commission meeting this month just because the projects we have in for review right now don't require public hearings, but we already know that we'll have stuff for next month. Susan, could yes. you repeat that first one? Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. That's a used car lot, is that what it is? It's an outdoor auto sales. It could be new, could be used um, on Upper Clark. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yes. Next Tuesday, the 19th, uh, the RFP for the housing element update closes. So we've got a group of staff who will be looking at those RFPs so we can bring you a consultant recommendation at the February meeting for that. And that's the first step that we're taking before we hit the rest of the general plan later this year with the RFP. And this is the one element that we had grant funding for, hence why it's a little bit more time sensitive and going first. Uh, for development projects on the consent calendar tonight was that final vote for the school district's rezone. So their septic permits ready to issue. We've got their lot line adjustment almost ready to record. Their building plans, uh, they talked to building staff yesterday. They should be ready to resubmit the corrections in a few weeks. So that's really rolling along. And that was just for the operations facility over there on Pearson. We also got a new master plan if you guys remember the uh, Paradise Gardens on Bushman, they're the subsidized senior housing close to Clark Road. There was three facilities. So this one's the one that's furthest west. 10 of the fourplexes burned down. So they're going through getting one master plan approved for a fourplex that'll save them in plan checking fees and then be ready to pull permits on all 10 of those. So that's exciting. We also have been both issuing and in the middle of plan checking for another duplex community on the corner of Elliott and Copeland. It's one of Marjima's old developments, kind of across from the Safeway Elliott entrance. Elks Lodge came in for their plan check. It's just over 14,000 square feet. So excited to see that one. There is a rebuild application in for the commercial building where Carolyn's 2 used to be or the old Allstate office right next to Hudson's Appliance. Right there tucked in the corner, it's about tw it's a little over twice the size that it was before. Looks like office space and I believe karate was on the other side, so that's in for plan check. And then <laughs> also we issued a temporary CFO for Lynn's Coffee and Crepes. You might have seen it on the news up at Clark and Skyway. That gave Lynn 30 more days to finish some just final corrections on some of the inspections. Some equipment's there, it just needs to be mounted. So she'll have 30 days to finish that. The other building, that's where El Rancho Mexican Restaurant is going to be. Their equipment's been sitting in there since pre-fire. It still has some more building inspections to pass, fire inspections, and environmental health. So close but still a little bit more work to do on that one. And then also, oh, that's right. We issued a building permit to the new owner of the old Juice and Java 2 on Clark Road, kind of across and up a little from McDonald's. So this is for drive through coffee. Uh, so this was just, um, they had a permit, it expired, new owner repulled it, just finishing the improvements. She's been working with environmental health Make sure she has all the inspections in place. So hopefully, I think the goal is by end of March to have that done and ready also. There's a sign yeah. on that building um, for an engineering firm. So the front half is drive through coffee and the back is office. And okay. they are using the office space already. Okay, yes. so it's going to be both. <laughs> yes. Okay, that was going to be You're grab, right. Grab your plans on coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and then... Well, not on the agenda, I do want to address the food trucks. So food trucks are just like the burn permits. They're a calendar year permit. So we did have three trucks that were licensed during the last calendar year. They've been noticed. We always give through January for them to get their paperwork back in. We need evidence that they've passed, you know, a current inspection with environmental health. 
and that the landowner has approved them to be on site, and then it's a new form. And then we've also identified the other food trucks that didn't have licenses, that we could send those packets to the landowners to get them enrolled in this you know, vending license process also. And yes, I know we've talked about it at a council level, very important, and it will be part of the renewals about the garbage service. So that will be part when they come in. We haven't received any yet. It's, you know, we're just in the second week so far. But that's certainly the plan. Okay. <laughs> and then if you guys had any questions about any specific sites you've seen out there, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Sounds like you've been okay. busy. <laughs> just a little. <laughs> Have you heard anything about Cozy Diner? Uh, just on the back half in terms of they've been working with engineers and so designers for septic. So that's been the first part. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. And same with Calico. They were trying to submit also, but they wanted to enlarge their seating, so they need to go back and reconcile septic. Okay. So we're hoping to see that come through, too. Is there any chance of reducing the fee for a lot line adjustment? Never mind. Uh oh, oh. <laughs> right. Any, any other questions for Susan? You look really great tonight. Susan. <laughs> thank you, you sir. Very nice. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Appreciate it. Okay, so with that, uh, we will uh, close this meeting and go to closed session. Do anybody, does anybody need a break before we go into closed session?